Why are you gay? Why are you gay? You are gay. Hey everybody, welcome back to Human Reaction, your weekly source for independent commentary on cultural news and politics, where it's always our mission to arm you with the tools you need to cut through media misdirection and resist the mono narrative. We're glad to be back with you. David, what are we talking about today? Uh, this week, Donald Trump showed off his comedy chops, so we're going to be reviewing some of that, and Kamala failed on comedy <laughs> pretty epically, <laughs> uh, and she got herself a real interview, which was interesting to watch, and actually some pushback and some real back and forth with an interviewer. Uh, James O'Keefe, James O'Keefe, James O'Keefe, James O'Keefe. <laughs> <laughs> reveals what everyone already knows, uh, that the meta is censoring the right in any criticism of Kamala. Um, and we got good news, sort of. The future has arrived. And what is it? It's the week of Elon Musk. He was killing it this week All with right. the We Robot event, SpaceX developments, campaigning. We don't do this just so that we get better coverage on X. I legitimately think, you know, covering the richest man in the world is newsy, important, and I think a lot of this technology, we'll be talking about the future of it. And there's a lot of misconceptions about the labor market and otherwise sociological effects of automation that we can talk, get into, I think. I'll have you uh, explain that to me like I'm five when we get to you it. You got it. <laughs> All right. And then uh, Reason Magazines, why libertarians love and hate it at the same time. And yeah. lastly, in the SCIF, fifth generation warfare, we're going to be diving into it. You're welcome, Skiff members. We that by request. Yeah. Fifth generation. That was warfare. that was an Adam request. Yeah. I yeah. love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Very yeah. much looking forward to that. Kyle, what are we up to now? Well, I've been gone the last two episodes and I was thinking a lot. And what I was thinking about is how not enough people are liking, following, and subscribing <laughs> to our channel. <laughs> you know, people gotta do that. They gotta do if that. If you like the content, make sure to do that. So you're always getting the notifications on whenever we drop an episode. Because I think rumor has it we might be starting to pump out more episodes in the future. I don't know. Big things on the Big horizon. Big things on the horizon. You might notice we're one week away from episode 100. Yeah. Mm. Never Woo! know. Never know. Kyle, did you have a, a good Canadian Thanksgiving? I. I mean, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what Canadian Thanksgiving is actually. I think they just like made up a holiday. Canadians tend to do that. They just make up holidays. I wasn't in Canada, so there was no Canadian Thanksgiving to be had. Uh, I, see. I was still in the great country of the United States of America, not that commie northern place. <laughs> so. Well, I love how you texted us after we sent uh, we sent you a happy Thanksgiving and you were like, the Canadians have nothing to be thankful for until after this election. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a big thing is this this current election in Canada. I have been following it and who is it going to be a seat change? Like we're talking plus 100 seats in parliament to conservatives and like minus 100 to uh, the libs. Wow. So like Canada is upset right now. And when you and when you see the news of Trudeau talking about like some members of the Conservative Party actually being foreign agents or paid by foreign agents. Yeah. That news this week, wild. We're not covering it today, but it was in the context of the election, which I wasn't thinking of when I saw that. It just looked like Trudeau being a piece of shit. But it that that's a huge information op right there. I, I, I did see I, I did see a hilarious uh um clip of him on the floor of parliament basically defending himself against being gay. <laughs> so Interesting. It was funny. Look here, guys. Totally not gay. I'm not gay. I promise. Yeah, he's like, guys, trust me. I'm not gay. It's like, it was very strange and odd. But anyways, uh, to find out more of how to support us, go to humanreactionpod.com. Um, and also join our Discord where we post a bunch of dank memes. And this one right here, I think is exactly how the election is going. You have a woman <laughs> sitting in a burning house and everything around her is falling apart. And she says, yeah, but abortion. <laughs> this is this is perfectly indicative of some people's rationale for how they're going to vote right now. Jeez, I, I was just in Arizona and like literally every time there's a commercial, it's just like six abortion commercials, just nonstop. Stop. Yeah, that's it's, the Democrats it's thing all right the now. Democrats have right now, just flooding in the market with uh, with abortion commercials. Wow. Which which just demonstrates just how poor our community, our collective understanding of the Constitution is. By saying it's not a federal issue, they're now trying to pin that on Trump as if he banned abortion. Right. Which, you know, is complicated. But, man, it's crazy how Very that's true. become the key issue of our time. Very IBF true. also being another thing in there. It was like throwing, that all got lumped in, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, yeah, regardless, let's go into some happy news. This was kind of a fun time. Uh, 
Donald Trump did the Al Smith dinner, classic tradition for uh, the American presidents to come together a couple weeks before the election and roast each other and kind of friendly banter. You know, famously, there was the Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump one back in 2016, which was kind of funny. Um, but Kamala Harris didn't show up to this one. And this is the first time a Democrat has not shown up since Walter Mondale. And this would be a very friendly audience in general, right? Mm -hmm. And for the most part, these are, you know, liberal elites. Yeah, right? in, New New York. in New York. In New York, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a Catholic event. Um, but yeah, and actually, I, I don't have the clip of this per se, but Trump actually mentioned this in his uh, time where the last Democratic candidate that didn't show up was Walter Ma Mondale, and he lost 49 states. <laughs> <laughs> to Ronald Reagan. To Ronald Reagan. Yes. He only won Minnesota, which was his home state. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see if, uh, if that trend continues in this case. Yeah, but uh, first off here, I Probably. have a, a quick clip from Jim Gaffigan, who was kind of the host of the event, and he did a, he did a pretty good job. Uh, he, was, he was very funny. And also a reminder... He had that famous clip on, on Rogan of being kind of TDS. He had very Trump derangement yes, syndrome. very so was, left, very and, um, in that frame of view. And yeah. I thought he played this very fairly yeah, over the so course too. of this. But president, right? After JFK, President Biden couldn't be here tonight. The DNC made sure of that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Look at Chuck Schumer right there. Just <laughs> oh, that's... <laughs> I guess I'm the only one that reads this history. event has been referred to as the Catholic Met Gala. 22% of Americans identify as Catholic. Catholics will be a key demographic in every battleground state. I'm sorry, why is Vice President Harris not here? <laughs> uh, Oof. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Did I you mean, consider this. This is a room full of Catholics and Jews in New York City. <laughs> this is a layup for the Democratic nominee. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in her defense, I mean, she did find time to appear on The View, Howard Stern, Colbert, and the longtime staple of campaigning the Call Her Daddy podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well That'd said. Good. Uh, did you see what she put out instead? Well, yeah. So that was the big thing was she she gave the they, she gave the Al Smith dinner this four minute video, and it was cringe. It was Super. bad. It was so well, cringe. It's like a reference to a SNL skit from the nineties. It was right? well, in, or early 2000s? a movie as well. Yeah. Um, that was a terrible movie, too. Totally. Yeah. I forget I forget everything about it, but Superstar, right? Was it uh -huh. was called? Yeah. 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 It was well, very, very cringy. Well, and there was a lot of, like, nervous and awkward laughter that happened after they played it, and Jim Gaffigan was still up on this. It was tw he, They presented it kind of at the end of his section here, and he's just like, what is that noise you're all making? <laughs> he, he, like, couldn't, he, like, couldn't tell. Like, it was, like, a really nervous, awkward <laughs> laughter with it. Um, yeah. It was rough. And in contrast, Trump had some absolute bangers. I watched the whole speech. Uh, it was it was pretty funny. There, there were some jokes that people didn't get that I was like howling about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, here's a, I, I guess this is a top five jokes from Trump yeah. on this video. I used to think the Democrats were crazy for saying that men have periods, but then I met Tim Waltz. <laughs> Well, I'd better wrap up because Mayor Adams told me earlier that I needed to make this one very quick, especially the city has reserved this room for a large group of illegal aliens coming in from Texas. <laughs> There's a group called funny. White Dudes for Harris. Have you seen this? White Sorry. Dudes for Harris. Does anybody know? Are, are some of you here? White Dudes for Harris doesn't sound like it. <laughs> but I'm not worried about them at all because... Their wives and their wives' lovers are all voting for me. <laughs> <laughs> the major issue Jesus. in this race is child care, and Kamala has put forward a concept of a plan. A lot of people don't like it. The only piece of advice I would have for her in the event that she wins would be not to let her husband, Doug, Anywhere near the nannies, just keep them away. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. a nasty one. That's Chuck a nasty Schumer one. is here looking 
Very glum. Right here. Right here. <laughs> Doesn't he look glum? He looks glum. <laughs> <laughs> but look on the bright side, Chuck, considering how woke your party has become, if Kamala loses, you still have a chance to become the first woman president. <laughs> <laughs> and listen to the laughter there. That's like legit laughter. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. Those are some good oh, jokes. Good. It, uh, it was solid. It, uh, it was, it was really, a fun time. It was yeah. solid. Yeah. Um, yeah. The whole like the whole Jim Gaffigan bit and the whole Donald Trump bit, like it's worth watching the full hour right there. It, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. About a half hour each. It was mm-hmm. really, really funny. This episode is brought to you by Revved Up Promo, the official apparel partner of Human Reaction. Revved Up is a premier full service shop specializing in laser engraving, screen printing, and embroidery. Not only are they now making all of our apparel right down the road from us, they can do the same for your brand and ship it to you anywhere in the world. Revved Up helps you navigate the extensive universe of merch options and uses state-of-the-art techniques to showcase your brand in its very best light. So if you want to support our show and our generous sponsor, you can now do so by buying our merch and by turning to Revved Up Promo for your own custom apparel needs. Reach them at revveduppromo.com. That's with two Vs and two Ps, or just check the show notes for a link. If you are a small business owner looking for exponential growth, you have to connect with Adam Thune at Intellectual Patriots. He will revolutionize your business game and help you get to the next level. Adam can streamline your business practices and advertising strategies to improve your bottom line. His expertise in data engineering means he can build you the systems you need to collect and analyze market data. His mission is to provide you with invaluable insights to fuel your success. From grant writing and business proposals to digital systems integrations, even AI management, Intellectual Patriots is a one-stop shop for cutting-edge solutions. Don't wait another second. Visit intelpatriots.com to learn more. That's I-N-T-E-L patriots.com. Let's go into uh, what Kamala's been up to. Yeah, what has Uh, Kamala been up to? She had an interview with Fox News with Brett Baer, and it's gotten a lot of uh, hubbub lately. Um, You know, we have... uh, we have the usual suspects, the neocon saying that Kamala came to uh, Fox to stack bodies. Yeah, mm. this is this is from a guy in the Lincoln Project. Yeah, Rick Wilson, if you remember the uh, Lincoln Project. Uh, didn't they have a bunch of... They, like, fell apart because of... A lot of sexual a lot of misconduct sexual, allegations. Yeah, allegations, didn't yeah. they? Right? Yeah, they're still they're still dropping ads, yeah. right? But uh, they had a lot of challenges with that earlier. This yeah, year. That, that just like re sparked in my mind. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but pretty pretty classic. Uh, <laughs> to stack bodies is a hilarious. I mean, one being a neocon. Uh, <laughs> two, two. It is so like it's the worst prediction ever made on social media, possibly because it was a disaster. Now listen to how she answers this question. On 70% of Americans on the wrong track. More than 70% of people tell the country is on the wrong track. They say the country is on the wrong track. If it's on the wrong track, that track follows three and a half years of you being vice president and President Biden being president. That is what they're saying, 79% of them. Why are they saying that? If you're turning the page, you've been in office for three and a half years. And Donald Trump has been running for office. But you've been the person <laughs> holding the office. Come on. Come on. Madam you Vice and I President. both know what I'm talking about. You and I both know what I'm talking about. I actually about. don't. What are you talking about? <laughs> what we're talking about is that over the last decade, but people you're the have become. Of power. But listen, over the last decade, it is clear to me, and certainly the Republicans who are on stage with me. Uh, that's where she goes on to brag about Liz Cheney, and, uh, you know, being with her and uh, Carl Rove and all the people of the Bush era that Republicans and independents dislike. And the left. Well, now they don't. <laughs> yeah. Like they, they, that's, That just shows to what degree the left is more interested in the maintenance of power than their ideas right yeah. now. Right. There are times when the left is interested in their own ideas, but right now it's not. It's about anti-Trumpism. In fact, when you do man on the street interviews right now, if, you, if you've seen some of those, every single time. It's someone who says, I know nothing about Kamala's point of view. Yeah. I know nothing. I can't claim any of her that she's like winning on anything that I any uh, policies I support that she's done or is promising to do. But I know Trump is bad. He's a racist. He's a sexist, all that kind of stuff. So and that, it, it fits. It does demonstrate, I think, the interesting place we're at with her running from a like campaign point of view where she plays as if she's a, a, not an incumbent when she is the incumbent and if you if you could say americans are confused about the about abortion and uh, the 
uh, status as a constitutional question with the Supreme Court and whether or not Trump should be blamed for what Ohio did or Wisconsin does on abortion. You know, that that's, you know, Americans are confused about that right now. Totally understandable. We have terrible constitutional education in this, in this country for the most part, right? But I don't think they're confused about who's in power and who's not, right? That I don't think that's a confusion point that is they're going to be able to leverage, right. unlike with abortion. Right. I, I do love how, just kind of reiterating what you said there, too, is Brett Bear asks her, like, okay, you know, you're trying to turn the page, but you've been in office as vice president for three and a half years. And her response is, but Donald Trump's been campaigning for eight years. Yeah. And you're just like, what? So <laughs> what? what's as, your point? Exactly. As if speech was the same thing as being literally <laughs> vice president with a president who is a, a vegetable. Right. Well, right. and it was also a very telling answer uh, when uh, Brett Baer asked her, at what point did you know that Joe Biden was not fit? I think that and, might be our uh, next one here. Yeah, it's a it's a very, very interesting answer from Kamala Kamala on that one. Let me ask you this, no, Madam no, Vice no, President. You call Donald Trump. The you you, you of that. call Donald Trump. Um, he's misguided. You say now he's he unstable. Is unstable. He is unstable. But uh, he's not well. well. You say he's it, mentally not stable. Uh, he's not stable. Let me ask you this. And, you and told many interviewers that Joe Biden was on his game, that ran around circles on his staff. When did you first notice that President Biden's mental faculties appeared diminished? Joe Biden, I have watched in from the Oval Office to the Situation Room, and he has the judgment and the experiment and experience to do exactly what he has drugs? done in making very important decisions on behalf of the American people. There Joe were Biden, no concerns Brett, raised. Brett, Joe Biden is not on the ballot. I understand. And but, Donald Trump, Donald Trump but is. But you talked about it. And Donald Trump after is. After George Clooney said within a few minutes of talking to Donald President Biden Trump, at a fundraiser that he thought this Brett, was not the same Brett, Joe Biden that we saw on the Donald debate stage. Donald Trump is on the ballot. I understand. You met with him at least once a week for three and a half years. You didn't have any concerns? I think the American people have a concern about Donald Trump, which is why the people who know him Stay best, yeah. including question, leaders of asked. our national security community, have all spoken out, even people who worked for him in the Oval Office, worked with him in the Situation Room, and have said he is unfit and dangerous and should never be president of the United States again, including his former vice president, which is why the job was open for him to choose another running mate. So that is a fact. That is a fact. But so is the fact that you were with the guy for three and a half years and claimed to the media that he was perfectly fine. And now he's pulled out of the race. Why? Because he's not fine. Because he's not, yeah. Because everyone saw that debate performance. And I mean, we haven't on. seen him since. Hardly, maybe a couple of times he's made a couple of statements. But the rest of the time he's just been on the beach, I guess. And, and goofing off, you know. Like yeah. Putting on MAGA hats and stuff. You know? <laughs> 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 that was pretty funny. Um, you, you know, it, it's, it's a thing, too, where I think what people, like, a lot of people are saying that Kamala did completely awful. I don't think she did that awful compared to other interviews I've seen. For some reason, I actually feel like she kind of does a little bit better in hostile environments than when she is in friendly environments. Like she gets kind of weird in friendly environments. Yeah, I think she's um, able to let her guard down. In this case, she's definitely thinking a little bit better on her feet. And the I, prosecutor I heard, in her kind of comes out a bit. Yeah. But the problem is she just reverts to talking points over and over again. I think what people want to see from her is who is the real Kamala Harris outside of these talking points. I think that's why the Trump podcast circuit has been so effective where a lot of people are seeing like, you know, the common thing is that he's being humanized. Like when he was on Andrew Schultz podcast, when he was on Patrick bet David's podcast, he's like, he's becoming way more human in a lot of people's eyes. Uh, unlike this, where it's like, even whether it's a friendly environment or a hostile environment, she's reverting to the exact same talking points. Yeah. You can, they're all the exact same. Well, I think at this point, most people, are recognizing that that's what she has. She mm -hmm. can do the talking points. She can do a scripted speech, but off the cuff, she's an absolute wild card. And I think you're exactly right. I think that's why she's losing. And we've talked, I think, a little bit amongst us off uh, of the podcast about the doom loop situation that Kamala mm -hmm. kind of finds herself in. Just to describe that for people, I believe, I D believe it was David, David Sachs, Sachs that, that, tweet about that kind it, of yeah. brought this to the forefront of, of this election, which is that Kamala's not doing well with her 
current strategy of hiding from the media. Mm -hmm. So she goes out and does media appearances. People realize, oh, she like really maybe doesn't have that much substance. It hurts her in the polls. Mm -hmm. So she goes and does another media hit. It hurts her again. So she has to go do another one. So she's now on this like kind of last minute tour of media where it's even been rumored that she might, she's considering appearing on the Joe Rogan show, mm -hmm. which I think would just be an absolute dumpster fire. But speaking of, uh, Trump said that he's going on Rogan. Right. Too. He said and, that and on the Nelk, Nelk Boys podcast on the full send. And then it was like the next day. It was like the Kamala camp is considering yeah. going on Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. Like I can only... I can only imagine what that experience would be like three hours or two hours of God, Kamala sitting across I from Joe Rogan. I hope it happens so much. So it would be it legendary. So it would awesome. be one of the most quintessential pieces of political media ever produced. Right. And it would be, it'd be equivalent to, I think, in terms of the way we think about campaigning, the way we think about presidential candidates and their qualification, the same way we changed with the first Nixon versus JFK debate where Nixon yeah. looked terrible and even though he was a poised, you know, professional, um, and his de and everyone on radio thought that Nixon won, everyone who saw it on on TV believed JFK. Because right. that was the first televised presidential debate. Because he looked so bad, and, right. yeah. and JFK is just so handsome. Also, that well, well, JFK that also had like hair and makeup, and yeah. Nixon was like sweaty and like didn't look good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it'd be it'd be the same kind of like sea change in the way we think about content. Uh, for making the decision of president, right? Because a two and a half hour podcast with a interviewer that's interested in real content, right? Develop, developing real value, not a, a mouthpiece for a certain party or a certain perspective, uh, but rather, you know, what I think Joe Rogan is, is a guy who's really interested in interesting questions and getting to the root of things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was pretty funny. I was watching uh, Andrew Schultz's debriefing after his interview with Trump last week. And uh, he was he was saying how all the different sides all looked at the interview differently. And he was expecting to have like, oh, the MAGA people are going to love me and the and the libs are going to hate me. But what ended up happening was the first the first uh, like run through of media was all the MAGA people being like, yeah, Trump's awesome. This humanizes him, et cetera, yada, yada. He was so funny. It's like everything that we love about Trump. And then it was like two days later, all the liberal media comes in and they're all like, look at this comedian making fun of Trump to his face. <laughs> and the left also loved it <laughs> in a weird way. And so you see like kind of like the narrative formation around these. But mm, yeah. overall, I think I think the right was more correct on that. I think it it's fun. It's humanizing for Trump in a lot of ways. And it's the same thing on, on the Patrick Bed David podcast that he did yesterday. Um, like Trump's out there. He's like admitting mistakes that he made. In, in long form content, yeah. like you never see that from Trump. Like, like he's he's fully going into more detail about like the personnel problems that he had, and he's kind of explaining like, yeah, this is kind of where the mindset was going in, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And Patrick really probed him with some pretty deep questions on it, and you're just like, wow, like it was actually kind of nice to hear that from a president. It wasn't like super scripted in a way where you would expect from these types of th types of interviews that you're getting from Kamala, right? Yeah. Like that's where she, she needs to open up more and just people don't see her. Does she though? Well, the problem is if she opens up more, does it get worse? Yeah. <laughs> that right. I mean, here's the thing. I think she could open up more if she was empowered to tell the truth, but what she has to do right now is basically run a cover up operation for the failures of the Biden administration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she can't as say she, probably what she really thinks Yeah, as she's in this weird spot where, I mean, and also she doesn't believe anything. Right. If if you are someone who is who's built a career over lying to acquire power, when the chips are down, you have nothing to fall back on. There's no axioms there to go back to. Right. So your instincts are just going to be off, and it's got and it's going to show in long form content. Now we actually had another one uh, from a different interviewer uh, from I believe this was actually the week before, but I thought it was really yeah. uh, it, it was very interesting, especially. Not everyone who listens to podcasts is from rural America, but we are. And how she thinks about the challenges on voting for rural America and authenticating the vote. Is agreeing to voter ID one of those compromises that you'd support? I don't think that we should underestimate what that could mean. Because in some people's mind, that means, well, you're going to have to um, Xerox or... or, or photocopy your ID to send it in to prove you are who you are. Well, there are a whole lot of people, especially people who live in rural communities, who don't, there's no Kinko's, there's no Office Max near them. People have to understand that when we're talking about voter ID laws, 
Be clear about who you have in mind and what would be required of them to prove who they are. Of course, people have to prove who they are, but not in a way that makes it it almost impossible for them to prove who they are. Yeah, so that word salad means that rural people are too dumb to use their cell phones, which almost all of them have, to use an app called Genius Scan, or even on the Android, I don't know about iPhone, but the Android, where it's built into the actual software of the camera yeah. to be able to scan documents. There's approximately 10,000 apps they don't to own, scan documents with a phone. Exactly. And they don't own printers, apparently, so they can't possibly take a picture of their ID and scan it and send it in with their ballot. Certainly not. I mean, it's, it's akin to saying that inner city black people don't have don't know how to work computers. Right, and this it's is like, BET, so they can't say which that. Which was what the right? governor of New York said. Yes, <laughs> and and Democrats have been kind of suggesting that for a long time, and it's been mocked to such a degree that I don't think it's a viable angle now. So now it's rural people. She's very concerned yeah. about the rural vote mm, and the turnout sure. of rural people who don't vote for Kamala, <laughs> who are not gonna. In that, and then second to that, rural turnout, and everyone in policy knows this, I and mean, this is very common. Rural turnout is very typically on election day. They don't vote by absentee as much because there are more traditional communities and voting on election day is more of an institution. So their poll workers have less problems because they're more like, oh, hey, it's Jim from the coffee shop. He's in the vote today. That's how rural America works. You know, like <laughs> it's it's very frustrating to watch her like like put up this 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 strange caricature of rural America as if she has any clue about it at all and claim that she's like fighting for this in order to protect their right to vote which is complete, they are more concerned about voter uh, fraud than most of America is, right? Because they see inner city people being able to vote with almost no requirement whatsoever. When they've been voting consistently, and rural America does demographically trend older, consistently for, you know, 30 years, 50 years, 60 years. It's It's crazy. Yeah. What... what, (laughs) This has always been one of those things where, like, what are the actual arguments for not having an ID to vote? Like, is it just this? Is some people are too dumb to have an ID? I mean, are we steel manning or? Well, cause that, that seems to be always the critique. It's just like, we have to be compassionate for the people that might not be able to, you know, just, and, and then they do like rural voters or black voters or whatever. And it's all, it all seems so like, you know, everybody has an ID in America, right? It's not, it's not crazy to require that. Well, and right now we have in California, they passed a law uh, just a few weeks ago that uh, that at the polls on any election, whether it be like county, state, whatever, um, the poll workers legally cannot ask for the ID. It is illegal really? for them to yeah. ask for it. Elon Musk said this on the Tucker interview that he recently did, and I was like, that can't be right. Went and looked at it. No, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> like, Jeez. It basically, what the law said is that counties can't create new laws around election that is is a higher standard than the state standard for election hmm. identification. So what that means in practicality is they have to keep the low standard of the state, which is you don't require an ID to vote. Well, and you it, can't it, ask it just for seems it. like they're incentivizing and, and, cheating. And which the, counties in, in pass those laws? Rural counties. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't LA County that passed that law, right? Yeah. They're worried about the rural counties. Yeah. It just seems like they're trying to provide more instances where cheating can occur. Right. Like that, that seems to be what the incentive is there. I, I don't really see another way around it. Like they, they, there's a guise around compassion of this, of like, well, we have to think about the people who can't do this, but it's just all the incentives are, well, now there's all these ways that we can fix things. We Allow can, people to vote who aren't citizens. It's how we fortify elections in here. You know? Fortify, quote unquote. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, from the left perspective, like, like, I mean, they can't just come out and say, well, we just want non-citizens to be able to vote but that's what they want i mean and that's what they're kind of angling for that's what some you know various legislation around you know asylum and citizenship has been targeted at right is getting people legal to vote Mm -hmm. right because i mean that's going to give them in their view the voter base that they need to basically be the one party in power forever Mm -hmm. right right so i mean what's like how can you how can you explain that to America without having to disguise it again, like working on this like very um, you know dishonest level? How can you explain it to the American people without saying, oh, we need to protect rural people, we need to protect inner city people who who just aren't that smart? How can you explain it to them without basically saying you're too dumb to vote? Which, yeah. which with an the, ID? The, the the coup d'état of that was already done, right? And it's that great video of that guy who's going around asking white college you know liberals. 
why voter ID laws are bad. And they all say because black people don't have IDs. And then they go to the black community and ask them, like, hey, do you know where to get an ID? He's like, yeah, you go up the block, two blocks over, and you go to the ID office. <laughs> like, it's like, everyone's like, of course everyone has an ID. What do you ask? Black people, right? It's a classic, you know, kind of leftist progressive way of using the black community as like a prop to justify their policy points of view, regardless of the facts on the ground. Is it racist? I think it's inherently racist, right? Because you're you're saying because there's something about them or their community or culture or whatever. I mean, race, maybe not, but at least bigoted to, to say that, you know, something about them isn't capable of navigating something that everyone else can navigate. We're not worried about Asians not being able to navigate this. Why is it black people you're worried about? Right? It, well, it, 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 well, it's association with poverty and stuff like that, too. But even in those circumstances, you're still dealing with if you're on welfare, you need an ID. Yeah. So it, you know, like, what, what are we talking about here? Well, well, speaking of the black vote, it has been a very interesting dynamic on black men and how much like this is something that we didn't necessarily prep here. Yeah, but that's true. The how how much the Kamala campaign is really concerned about the black male vote right now, um, so much so that they put out that tweet. And I, th I think it's still Kamala's pin tweet where they're just like, here's my policy. Here's our policies to help black men. And it's like. We're gonna make, we're gonna make, uh, we're gonna decriminalize marijuana so black men can can prosper in this growing industry. We're going to offer protections for crypto investments for black men who make crypto trades. Mm -hmm. It was just like, it was like all the stuff that everybody can do. <laughs> it was just like we're we're gonna have this special protections for black men specifically. It was wild. And then you had Obama going to that black that that like black event um, where he's just like, mm -hmm. you know, you know what's, you know what the problem in here is just some of the brothers aren't voting for the first female president, you know, and that's he not accuses okay. them of, <laughs> of being of sexist. sexist. Yeah. And, but that, that is, the did you guys see Stephen A. Smith's response to this? No. no. Oh my God. It's beautiful. I have to pull it up right now. Give okay. me two seconds. To there, it. Yeah. Put it in the notes and I can pull it, but it's, it's no longer a top pin tweet. She she has it's a, from October 16th, something about uh, a second debate. Trump has refused, but, it, 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 what, it, what it was was like it's not a policy paper but it's like her argument to black men which which itself is a very interesting thing right so the democrat party has traditionally been built off of you know a, a coalition of unions minority and minority voters and rural white women right that's kind of mm -hmm. like the democrat national body and if they're in latinos uh, since the bush since post bush era if that's falling apart for them, that means there's something deeply like problematic with their existing brand, the black community. And, and you know, I, I, I don't think I fully understand it, but there's something happening there that they're trying to respond to and obviously failing to, yeah. to really get a grip around. Well, he, he, here's the tweet that I was referencing from Kamala here. Right. So we have she tweets out black men deserve a president who cares about making their lives or, Black men deserve a president who cares about making their lives better. And then they put up this Harris Walls policy. Kamala Harris will create an opportunity agenda for black men. Provide one million uh, loans that are fully forgivable up to $20,000 for black entrepreneurs and others to start a business. So just racial just racial prejudice on these <laughs> loans <laughs> being granted, yeah, right? I don't think that's legal. I don't know if you could do nah, that. I don't think so. <laughs> um, support education training and mentorship programs that lead to good paying jobs for black men, including pathways to become teachers because government mentorship trainings probably are going to work out well, I'm sure. <laughs> um, protect cryptocurrency investments so black <laughs> men who make them know their money is safe. What does that even mean? <laughs> what does that mean? What so does they, that even they, mean? The, the SEC is going to have special protections for black men. <laughs> like, what, what are we talking does about? Does that imply here? that their money is not safe? In a bank? Yeah, this, like, what are we talking about here? something here. <laughs> um, launch national health initiative focused on the illnesses that disproportionately impact black men. So we're just going to, we're hyper-focusing. This is a, we got... RFK, make America healthy again. Very universal. And then, yeah. no, we're just going to launch national health initiatives specifically for black men. Which, which like, I okay. don't imagine black men are being like, are like, oh, thanks. You know, yeah. like, you know, I just don't see that being the response to that. It's a little patronizing. Infantilizing? Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And, then, and then lastly, legalize recreational marijuana and create opportunities for black Americans to succeed in this new industry. <sighs> which is also just like, black men, you like drugs? <laughs> We, we can get I, you drugs. I, I, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. It's such it's such a uh, to be clear pessimistic. I, I do support legalizing, but that's just such a weird way to frame it. Like this is why we're going to do it. Yeah. Well, well, if a Republican did it that way, it would be obviously it would be 
casted as racist, implying yeah. a racial bias towards even or, though whites use marijuana too and enjoy recreational marijuana. What are we doing here? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, is there I, is there oh, a specific point God, in this? This is so good. So I sent I sent you a different link. Go to the. the oh. I, I put it in the same place. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I gotcha. Oh man. Yeah, this Pulling is so us. good. So Stephen he, A. Smith, uh, you know, very well known sports broadcaster, responding to Obama. We have the the Obama clip here, and then his reaction to it. I've got a problem with that because because part of it makes me think, and I'm speaking to men directly now. Part of it makes me think that, well, you just aren't feeling the idea of having a woman as president. I'm going to say it again. Respectfully, what say you said is Thank not you. acceptable. Not to me, not to a host of black men out there. You see, what you're missing is that you're basically accusing black men who come up with a reason to not support Kamala Harris as engaging in misogyny. Whatever happened to disagreeing without being disagreeable, President Obama? What happened to that? All of a sudden, we want to challenge men and our love and our affection as black men for black women. We want to bring that into question because we've got an election coming up and people may have the temerity to think differently than you. It's because she's a woman that she's in danger of losing this election. Is it possible that the only reason some black folks, not me, may not be inclined to vote or they may be a dis bit disenchanted or dare I say may even be willing to go as far as voting for Trump. Is it possible that it's policy as opposed to misogyny? Is it possible that they looked at a Democratic Party that is locked in on addressing or not addressing immigration and folks crossing the borders illegally and have prioritized focusing on that along with other issues, identity politics and beyond, that that has become such a focal point that has turned off folks in the African-American community. Some, not most, not all, just some. He's right. Ah, he nails it. Yeah. Well, and it is interesting dynamic because um, most of the polling basically shows that this election is um, men versus women and college educated versus not college educated those are like the two primary factors on where the are, where the votes are going right now and you know men overwhelmingly going for trump women overwhelmingly going for harris and then college educated overwhelmingly going for harris not college educated overly overwhelmingly going for trump like that seems to be the major distinction right now of where all the polling lies at the moment too is there an age factor there too or is that less of a less of I don't a, know. It, like clear division? I feel like, the, and this is just like a gut. My feel right now is that Gen Z is going more, much more conservative over time right now. Well, it's it's actually the, if I understand it right, is that the partisan divide amongst genders of Gen Z is just wider. Yeah, that's so actually right. A yeah. larger portion of Gen Z males are Republican than any other time, and a larger proportion of Gen Z females are the other are leftists. Gotcha. So interesting, I, I, and I, I'm not sure that the and in general younger people do turn Democrat, but that's like if you're if you're typical is at sixty percent and Democrats are actually doing fifty percent, that's a huge change in difference. Does that make sense? Or seventy oh, yeah. percent and sixty percent, whatever that change factor is, that's what they're going to be looking to. Um, still, nominally, white women make up a larger proportion of the total electorate. So mm -hmm. if Trump does lose. It's going to be because of the white women rural vote, or um, suburban vote. It, to be it, clear, that, that uh, uh, that's my prediction. This is this is a bit of an anecdotal story, but I just I was somewhere in Arizona and just nearby, I there's like this little eight year old girl watching YouTube on her on her uh, iPhone, and an ad pops up, and just she has it, no headphones or anything. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Um, and a Kamala Harris ad comes on, and she looks at her dad, and she's like, "Why would anyone vote for Trump?" Kamala's for abortion <laughs> and you're just like an eight, like an eight year old what? girl. And it, it's just like one of those things where you're like, Oh yeah. Like this, it, it kind of distinguishes that you're just like, okay. Yeah. Like little girls just being like Kamala Harris. And then, you know, young men being like Donald Trump. You know, it, it, yeah. I think it showcases probably where the future is going and the split continuing to increase. That's a terrible right? thing for humanity. Anecdotal, but you know, uh, but I don't. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's well, and it's also and it's also the question is is uh, amongst the black community is Kamala Harris understood to be black, which is a major question. You got you got um, 
Candace Owens dropping a video <laughs> a week. That's a, hitting a day, four million. Uh, yeah, hitting four million views. Four million views. Investigating whether or not she's indeed her biography checks out. On top of that, Kamala Harris is also dealing with a plagiarism scandal on her book that she wrote as AG. Yeah. Right. right. So she has her biography, which which uh, Candace is picking apart. It's been publicly shown that she plagiarized huge section, huge sections and important sections of her book about crime and her work as AG. What about this woman isn't an artificial construct right. and, well, and potentially and, and, and people who are engaged with that, especially younger black men who are on the Internet, might not be on board with being sold a lie. Right? That's that's uh, potentially right. That could be how it's. That could be the underlying factor. Here. Well, and, and it further emphasizes too, and it's like if the Candace investigations end up being pain, like she's kind of actively investigating with her audience right now. So like mm -hmm. a lot of these are kind of like confirming and debunking in real time with each like daily episode she's doing. Um, Kamala was on an interview, was on a podcast at one point recent in recent weeks where she was like actively talking about the one drop rule which kind of further emphasize it. And what the one drop a, rule is, it's a discriminatory, it's a, like a, it's a law in, it's a law that in regards to what you can legally claim as your racial identity, you have to be one eighth or higher of that racial identity to be able to claim it. And for her to be like actively <laughs> talking about that is very strange because if some of the Candace investigations turn out to be true, um, it suggests that she might be less than one eighth black. Wow. Uh, because of confusions about her grandmother and like the people per being portrayed in her biography as relatives weren't actually relatives and like they're like family friends or the help and like she's completely disregarding all of the Caucasian relatives that she has and really not emphasizing the Indian side of the family. It's very, very it's all very strange. Like, and she's, she's always been half Indian, but the question right now is like, is she actually half black or is she actually way less than that? Like it's yeah. a, it's a confusing it, question because, and it also offers a question. Why do so many of these Western leaders have such strange dynamics with their genealogies. <laughs> why isn't it more straightforward? Why, why, why is this all, why does this continue to be the case? It's very odd. Noticing. Yeah, it, it is, is very too much odd. noticing. I was just yeah, like, yeah, you just, <laughs> it, maybe it's just that they're all artificial puppets that are just sort of constructed to be some little perfect political, you know, automaton that can just be manipulated in whatever way they need. Well, yeah, it's just like it's it's that way. Is like Macron's that way. The the former prime minister of of uh, Ireland is kind of that way. There's questions about who Justin um, Trudeau's father is. Yeah, it's like is true is is Trudeau the son of Castro? Yeah, like that's a conspiracy <laughs> theory. You know but that it, that is not very substantial. But like, there's anecdotal stuff that could portray in that it, Obama has a lot of really weird stuff around him. Yeah. 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 Um, so his his dad is an African Marxist who came to study while his mom is related to Dick, Dick Cheney. Wait, Barack Obama's mother is related to Dick Cheney yeah. and George Bush. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, all I mean, it's not so close, strange. but it's, it's, it's very strange how close that, that comes together into one person in Hawaii. Uh, additionally to that, who was then raised by bankers like his grandparents in Hawaii. Like you just just reading his actual biography is not done by him, but about done by other people is it, it, you look at it like this guy's got a very unique background and you look at these other foreign leaders also have very different backgrounds from everyday people. Unlike Trump, who has a dad and a mom, and you research the genealogy, and people, it's been all vetted we out. We see it's Fred all Trump. Very clear. We see how Fred Trump made his money. We, yeah, we all that. It's, it's, all, it's all very clear. Like he went out to California and all this stuff during the gold rush. Like it's all there. Where where it's like there's there's something about these world leaders that we have where they make a biography, and that biography becomes the mythology, and everything else gets dispensed with. So they get to craft exactly what the thing is, mm -hmm. and then that is what all the journalists report on is the biography story, not the actual story. And then you just disregard people in their actual lives that come forward with other evidence, right? And, and to make it less conspiratorial, just think about it for a moment. If you are part of um, a, a richer, um, more globalized elite, and you go around the world and make relationships and do all this kind of stuff that 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 has been going on since you know America became the global hegemon, and uh, think about it like in terms of the campaigns incentives uh, incentives for the campaigns. If you find someone who's attractive, articulate, and interested in politics, you try to cultivate them towards a political end for your team, and people do that all the time, right? Uh, I've been in the rooms and campaigns where people are like, okay, this guy's got this benefit and this benefit. They're attractive. They have the right connections. They're wealthy. They're not this, they're that. 
all of those things are all important factors in electability. These are the artifacts, potentially, of both having an oligarchy and having democratic processes where what really matters is how attractive you are. And Kamala was a, a, a very pretty woman when she was younger, making her a better candidate than she otherwise would be. Because the reality is people do vote based upon how attractive someone is. For sure. Yeah. Oh, so, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. all right. So uh, the next up is uh, Meta, uh, OMG Media. James O'Keefe uh, came out with a new thing. And I, I, we, we, we can uh, look at the uh, video. I'll just talk over it, though, because it's a little bit long. And just kind of dive into some of the findings of this, because I do think when we look at the censorship industrial complex and the uh, there's there's always there's a couple different there's a four quadrant thing going on at all times with this. Right. You have the government, you have private industry, you have nonprofits and you have the media. And the interesting thing about the private sector here is they don't have good incentives to censor or to con content moderate without the pressure of governments, without the pressure of the media, and without the pressure of nonprofits on the media to then put pressure on to the private companies, right? So when you look at the private company's individual um, content moder moderation strategies, which is what this reveals, it shows us some interesting new things about how they're talking about it and how they're diving into. So this is a typical, uh, what, is it, what is it called, Citizen Swiper? American Swiper. Sting, American, American Swiper. Swiper. James O'Keefe. Where you got a girl <laughs> to go on to, uh, I think, Bumble and get the, go on a, a date with this guy who is uh, one of the upper level people at Meta uh, to, who then kind of, you know, talks about well, what are you doing to fight information and to make sure that Trump doesn't lie his way into the presidency and all this stuff. And basically what he says is we have something that uh, probably AI that automatically de de demotes civic content. So you want to know why our Instagram sucks? <laughs> <laughs> Everything we do is civic content. Yes. Right? So if it automatically demotes civic content, meaning anything about politics, and then automatically then detects for whatever they call hate speech, and then demotes that. Right? So if you're at all, and what does that got to be? It's going to bias the hate speech algorithm towards anything that's controversial, that criticizes climate change as hate speech as much as it is about transgenders. Right? It, so, it, it is also interesting, actually, just speaking of our Instagram sucking, is <laughs> in the beginnings of us growing this podcast, Instagram was our best platform. Yeah, we were. Far. Yeah, we 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 very early on were hitting like very high view count videos, and then all of a sudden it was just like one day it snapped us out of it, and it was like okay, twenty views, twenty. You know, it was yeah. like, and then TikTok became our our biggest, highest performing content channel now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, now followed by X. Yeah. Correct. So yeah, the. Um, yeah, he does mention that they have a special team that he calls a SWAT team set up in April to, quote, prevent another 2016. Now, what that seems to be referencing is Trump media ads that were placed using, I forget what the company was called, but they Cambridge had- Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica, using that description. Now, all of those rules have changed. You, can't no long, you can no longer get access to emails and various different things that you used to as advertisers on the meta platform. But that seems to be beyond that. A team seems to me to be orientated towards specific messaging and narrative formation question controls, right? Uh, and to, quote, think through the scenario where the platform can be abused. Meaning, to me, this sounds like, well, we're basically have a team that's specifically out there to make sure that Trump doesn't win the election. Does sound like that. And it's interestingly juxtaposed against Mark Zuckerberg coming out recently as being, quote, unquote, libertarian yeah. or ish libertarian mm -hmm. um and but, it makes you wonder like similarly to how like maybe jack dorsey wasn't entirely in control of twitter towards the latter part of his tenure as as ceo mm -hmm. is mark zuckerberg in a position where he could if he wanted to make any sort of meaningful changes to this and i i, I don't know the answer i think that. people often put too much um like too much power in their minds on the CEOs of these massive publicly traded companies. Uh, there's so many different incentives and forces that are at work here on these things where the CEO only has so much control on right, things. Right. And so like it might be one or the other, like I'm not necessarily defending or promoting Zuck in here and his transformation that he seems to be going through, but there, there is evidence 
in my mind in the past of him being like very worried about the censorship practices that are going on in social media companies before he got slammed and called an anti-Semite by the ADL back in 2018, 2019 era. And an advertiser Um, boycott totaling in value at 60 60 billion billion dollars market cap facebook crashed this is in 2019 right right before the 2020 election and it might even be worth me rehashing my banning situation on here because it might help people kind of formulate in their mind what happens around people Mm -hmm. when i got banned from everything in like 2020 2021 era um uh, I instantly lost my, uh, I, I, I recognized and found out I was banned from Facebook on election night, 2020. Um, it was late at night. I might've been banned earlier. I didn't, I hadn't looked at Facebook. I was, I was in a call with a friend who was running for office and he showed, he sent me something on Facebook on election night. It was like, you, Kyle, you got to check this out. And when I went in, it said that I was indefinitely suspended with no, and it told me that I, there was no room for recourse. I tried, I tried getting in with like customer service the next day. It didn't, it failed, didn't work. I made a new Facebook account the day after. So the day after the election in 2020, and uh, I made a post like, I'm still alive. My Facebook got banned, basically. Got got instantly hit with a 30-day suspension Wow! after making the post. Mm. And since then, I still have that account. But pretty much every time I go back to use it, like it'll be like I post into a Facebook group with like my old high school Facebook group like when we were having a reunion. Tried to post in there, another 30-day suspension. Really? Like, like multiple times over and over again, I just get flagged with 30-day suspensions. And it doesn't tell me I have a 30-day suspension. It'll be something like I, I get hit with somebody will DM, DM me on Facebook Messenger and I try to respond and I just get red flag and it doesn't go through. Really? Right? It, it, I don't get told I'm in a suspension. I'm just like locked in this weird limbo jail where I can't do anything. I can't post anything or whatever. And it doesn't tell me that I can't do it. I just get these red error messages on them. And then, and then it'll, without fail, I'll go back 30 days later and I can do it again. But then it'll be like I post again. Oh. The other 30 day suspension, something Wait, like that. Just quit posting the N word. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I but, thought this was a free country. <laughs> yeah. But, but like, like that's the type of stuff that happens where you just get like completely. But the weird thing is I have separate accounts from my one that got banned and it was like, I don't know, like some, I don't know, face. It got my, got my face, got my name. I don't know. I would just be hit with these suspensions over and over again. But it wasn't just Facebook, was it? No, I got hit everywhere around that time. Like, pay, I lost PayPal. I'm banned from Venmo. All this stuff, right? Um, Twitter came later. Some Twitter accounts got banned. I had a Twitter, another Twitter account that got hacked. Um, but yeah, like I, I ended up just kind of losing everything over the course of like a six month period. Like, yeah. I would just like randomly be hit, hit, by, hit by stuff. Airbnb, Uber, lost those. Every, every, like just everything, no, no cause for recourse. I was, I was literally just like, it was like one in the morning. I was in another city trying to get an Uber to my, to my Airbnb that I had to create a new Airbnb account to get that Airbnb. Cause I found out on that trip, I was banned from Airbnb and then I was <laughs> trying to get an Uber from a bar to come back to my Airbnb. And then I realized I was banned on Uber. <laughs> like it, it, it so, just nothing. You didn't get told anything. Well, right? that substantiates two things. One, that these platforms have to be coordinating in some way for you to be banned from everything pretty know. much like at the same moment. And two, just how dangerous it is that like so much of our networking, so much of our lives is digitally connected mm-hmm. that if we allow for there to be some sort of centralized controlling entity or this networking power that goes on amongst these platforms, that they can basically deperson you like yeah. completely, like they can prevent you from having a roof over your head tonight. If you're on a trip and you can't get a car from a bar to a place to stay, <laughs> Where where are you going? What are you doing? Well, because that was the funny thing is on that trip, I went to book an Airbnb for a wedding and I found out when I was booking that Airbnb that I was banned from Airbnb, <laughs> right? Like I no longer had my Airbnb account. <laughs> like, and, and then I, I just created a new account, right? Like that's all I did. And then, and then it was on that trip later that I found out I was banned from Uber. Cause like, I didn't know I was banned from them cause I hadn't used the services in a bit, you know, this is COVID era, you know? So it was just... <laughs> Well, you know, most hey, of the hey, founders of those apps have houses in the club. You should just go s- knock on their door. Hey, 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 Come what's on. up? Hey, what happened? What's going on? <laughs> it, it, so it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a common listserv for malicious actors, mm-hmm. probably set up by an academic think tank that says these are the groups and emails associated with disinformation or misinformation. And, and therefore, that's why it would have a unified effect. Yeah. 
we now understand, uh, unlike in 2020, when a lot of this stuff was just not making sense and everyone's like, what's going on? To what degree is this private? To what degree is this government? And there was dialogue about that. We now know the architecture of this. And if you bring up the graph that I have actually posted below this, Kyle, this kind of demonstrates part of the overversion of the, like kind of the making overt of the underlying structure of the mis and disinformation as a social phenomena against free speech. You wow, know, so this, this graph is establishing the mentions of misinformation and disinformation. In the news media and academic papers. And you notice at the exact same time, circa 2016, it rockets up. Wow. Now, it's come down in the news media. What, what Do you have a hypothesis as to why that is? But I assume it's the Twitter files, right? Right? Like, if you use those words now, people go like, oh, well, it's that sort of thing now, right? Yeah. Mm. Well, academia is not as, not as uh, responsive to the, to, the, to the pressure. So that's why I said it's really four quadrants. You have government and, their, and what they do. You have the academics. You have the news media, you have private companies. And the private companies have no real incentive for this. The government has a tremendous incentive to this that they then establish for the academics. You had the, the National Endowment for Democracy gives grants to the Stanford uh, Signals Intelligence Institute, who then builds the list. Maybe Kyle winds up on that list. And then they give that to the private companies and say, these guys are spreading misinformation. And then you get banned. The other part of that is that they then put out a press release saying, look at all this great work we're doing to the news media and how dangerous misinformation is. And the news media reports on it and they say, X isn't doing their job. So this is like, it, it, and this isn't new information per se, and we kind of covered this topic before, but I think it's just demonstrative of any, you get a, you get a, a, a slice of what's going on with the CIC, right? But it doesn't pull the whole picture. Hillary Clinton two weeks ago was saying how we yeah. need to repel, repeal Section 230 in order to force companies to repeal. That is the government, to, uh, to, to content moderate. Sure. That is the government putting pressure on private companies directly by threatening their legal protection for the things that people post online. They know that's very be very difficult to do because there's a, there's a large tech lobby that's going to oppose that. So they don't really need to repeal Section 230. They just need to threaten that and then apply pressure everywhere across it. That's, that is, and that is a good example with the CIA calls their whole of society framework, where you take all these different friends of society and apply pressure to get the result you want without changing the law. Because you can't change the law because we have this thing called the free, you know, the First Amendment, and then you got to f- fight the legal, the legal battles, which are undetermined, especially with the current makeup of the Supreme Court. Yeah. Wow. Well, and this is all designed to kind of put pressure on Elon specifically, right? Because mm-hmm. he's kind of the one holdout amongst at least American um, social well, media Elon, companies. I think, well, and I think, I think people underestimate uh, uh, t- uh, TikTok's openness too. The reason why TikTok got into trouble it did is because it wasn't content moderating criticism of Israel enough. I mean, that's what we've covered it uh, at Engel, and I think that still holds true. And you can't find Israel critics on TikTok as easy as you used to. Hmm. For I mean, that's probably why it's not in the news cycle anymore. Yeah. I, I also think that we need to create a separation in how we talk about this about private companies versus publicly traded companies. And that's one of the big differences here with Elon is Twitter is actually a private company now. When these publicly traded companies, they have all these other incentives that come at play. So it's like, you know, you you were saying like private companies don't have really the same incentive that like the government has in this, but like the publicly traded companies do. Mm. They have their shareholders and they're and they're they're uh, beholden to um, having to create shareholder value and they're beholden to all these different laws with the sec and then they have these massive organizations coming in and buying all these shares and influencing the direction that the company takes all the blackrock vanguard etc um and then you have things like the dei stuff and you have the um and you have the esg programs that are put in place to create the incentives for and then and then also they're like very restricted by they're 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 almost more so restricted by public perception than than privately than private companies are because then they have like the adl coming in on them and they have you know it's it's a mess where they have to deal with all of this uh public backlash in a lot of ways where with twitter right now elon he's such like a singular force and he can just kind of take things and steer things in direction he has his own investors and things like that that he's beholden to because he took on some debt for the buy 16 billion billion dollars or whatever that cost was is a lot right yeah. but 
But it's a different thing than what, say, Zuckerberg has to go through or what former Twitter has to go through Mm -hmm. in the financing structure. And you can't underestimate the degree to which uh, environmental social governance plays a role, especially in big money when it comes to these privately traded companies. We've covered this a little bit in the past, but just to reconnect on that real quick. ESG. Yeah. the, The social component of that is to what degree is your ranking as an institution benefiting the social sphere of... Are of American society, and to, and part of the metrics of that is your content moderation around mis and disinformation. They never say malinformation, but it's also in the play. And remember, malinformation is just true information that's uh, contrary to the to the uh, to the narrative. Well, and embedded in that stuff is like how tolerant are you of trans stuff or yeah. how tolerant and, and like those have a political bias so mm-hmm. they're all going to steer in a very particular direction right mm-hmm. so like th- there was a famous moment of tim pool on rogan um kind of debating with uh with jack dorsey and vijaya what's it whatever her name is the former Gotti. Uh, Gotti, Gotti. yeah um <laughs> Relax. Every child. time, every time, <laughs> every time. I was like, but, "Poor woman's name." <laughs> but 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 that that was the. She's just an Indian name. I know, but it's, um, unlike Kamala, it sounds like vagina. I don't know who, what to tell you, buddy. Who, it's every time, it's who funny. Spe- who speaking of was it's like one, if my name was Dick, I wouldn't be surprised if people giggled every well, now. And well, who speaking I mean? of was one of the people that was fired by Elon yes. in the early early days of the takeover. But uh, that was that was one of the big things. It's like, no, our our uh, our content moderation policies are non bias. They're they're not political and. And uh, Tim Poole was saying, like, no, you have written into your TOS that dead naming is a violation. That is political. You have like half the country that doesn't believe dead naming is a thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. It, p- politically speaking. And then the other ha- half of the country is like the most immoral thing you could ever do. Like, this is a political divide of, of left versus right on this exact issue. And they're like, oh, never really thought about it that way. Yeah. <laughs> in classic Dorsey fashion, right? Classic. Um, I did meet a guy in college whose name is Richard Tickler. So I think he takes the cake for... Shout out to you, Richard Tickler. <laughs> Kudos to you, Richard, if you're watching. All right. So uh, speaking of Elon, he had a kick-ass week, man. It was really cool to watch. Uh, you know how we just live in this like terrible moment? Like This is the only week in several weeks that we haven't talked about World War III. I could have. There was some interesting things happened in Mali this week, but I didn't. I decided. Yeah, we'll take to leave a week Mali off. Alone. Yeah, we'll hit it hard at, for episode one hundred. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fascinating to watch uh, the We Robot event that pulled off this week, um, where we had a couple new things introduced by Tesla. Uh, this is a Tesla event, and uh, I think this is indicative of a. Jordan Peterson, an Elon interview recently where Jordan actually takes out like a tour of the Tesla factory and he says something along the lines of, it's interesting to the degree to which this is a robot company that happens to make cars. And he's like, yeah, that's a really good way to say it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and we got introduced to a couple of new things. One is the uh, the cyber cab or the full auto taxi. Uh, that's actually the bus. You want to go to the other one? There you go. So you can blow that one up, Kyle. Uh, and you He's know, Elon actually, an astronaut? <laughs> with a, or is that a robot? <laughs> no, it's not a robot. Oh, okay. And then Elon gets sure? into the tab. And now what's cool about this is it, it has no, um, it has no driving, no, no steering wheel, no pedals. None I hate of that those stuff. wheels. I just hate those wheels so much. Oh, you hate them? Oh, I think they're terrible. I think they're awesome. No, they no. look so cool. No, 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 no. Everything's so, so different. It's so futuristic. Mm-hmm. And, and they actually, they had several out there where people could drive around and actually like go to different places in the event. Um, you see the, the light effects thing there. It seems very unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, so Elon literally like pulls up in one of these and then he offers for people to be able to go check them out afterwards. Uh, soon after he gives kind of his initial part of the keynote and then he introduced the Robovan or Robovan. Robovan. Yeah, ro- Robovan, which is it's such strange that... It's yeah, he's pronouncing it Robovan, but yeah. it's spelt Robovan. Robovan, yeah, I, I'm a South African thing. I don't know. It's kind of funny. Well, I, no, I, I think it's I think it's actually kind of supposed to be a joke in Elon's uh, mind. Right? <laughs> Where it's like it's a Robovan, but let's just smash it together. <laughs> Robovan. <laughs> Robovan. Uh, so yeah, and we get to play the audio on this one because it, it gives uh, I think a key part of the speech. Yeah. What do you think about the aesthetic design on this one? Um, so, like, it would be quite fantastic. Kind of an Art Deco vibe for me. Also, what 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 happens Future if you vintage? need a vehicle that uh, is bigger than a Model Y? 
Yeah, it seats it like, looks like it something seats like 15 that a bunch of like droid the, warriors would get out of, it. and then just like start like the shooting into a crowd, is, uh, like for all his robot this is a army. Yeah, yeah basically. Make this. And it's gonna look like that. Now, can you imagine going down the streets and you see this coming towards you? That'd I'd go the other way. <laughs> I, think I, mean, I think it's sick. I think I would be on this. I think it looks cool. I think it looks pretty cool too. It's pretty sweet. And it's pretty much two rows of seats this can, this facing can each other. Up to 20 people and it can also I can't, I can't imagine this navigating any sort of, like, variability in road surface. No, 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 it's very much for cities. Uh, or Dude, even in the cities, the roads are crap. Imagine, like, so going over, gonna, like, the apron into a parking lot. Is what's gonna, oh, how low profile so, it is? Yeah, it's just, there's no city. clearance. So if you, if you want to take I'm all about practicality, David. I just have to take the contrarian view on this because you're no, so okay. you're so into it. I gotta, no, no. I gotta well, I, I, I'm <laughs> play devil's advocate. I'm here. only yeah. into it to the degree to which I I think. Well, one, if you were somebody who was interested in improving transit, that it would be an interesting. Now, now here's the aesthetic question: um, Are the designs stolen? Right. And this I robot to the event. It was literally the the event's called We Robot. Right. So he kind of invokes the it, it, and then additionally that it's the aesthetic design choices are are they similar? Well, I mean, uh, and people are kind of claiming that, and then they're using it as like a platform for criticism as well. So go ahead, what do you what do you think? Well, I, I guess my question is like, what what is the contention like that he should be sued because he stole these designs from Audi from iRobot or whatever? No, I don't know about that. It's more like it's more like invoke. It's like the symbolism of what's going it's on. It's like he's not being creative. He's just sort of like rehashing these like, you know, well, is the, futuristic is, is, tropes. Are the buses even similar, right? One is, what I mean, they're similar, but very different in many ways too. I mean, you can look at the car. Is they similar? Well, kind of, but not really. I mean, and even the core design of the uh, of Optimus itself is, you know, it's a humanoid robot. How many different ways can you make a humanoid well, robot? Well, I, I, I right. think a lot of our technical development is just generally inspired off of sci-fi. Yes, in, definitely. As a whole, like I don't, I don't really see a problem with this at all. It, it like in a lot of ways, our sci-fi creators are the ones creating kind of the framework that is inspiring the people that are making the new innovations. Yes. and Elon is a deeper. Elon is a very kind of deeply read sci-fi nerd. Mm -hmm. He talks about that openly quite a bit. Like he's a big fan of Heinlein and all in all these ma well, massive sci-fi. And you writers. can make the 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 taxi or the bus to look like a taxi in a bus, or you can make it look awesome. Like that's the look, that, that's I, how I, I, I just realized why you were smiling yeah, at me as did. I was saying that. It just yeah. it dawned on me. Yeah, you did. I missed it. What? <laughs> oh, he, he's gonna make a pre-programming <laughs> reference. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I was like, why yeah, is all this media is like really influencing the creators coming up with new technology? <laughs> hmm, I wonder what I, we could I was call like, that. why is Joe smirking at me as I'm talking? It was very distracting. <laughs> all right. So, what does pre-programming mean? <sighs> we're not gonna go down this rabbit hole. No, right no, now. no. No, we, we've, we've derailed this podcast a lot. We have a lot to get through with this. It, All right, we we don't have to go into pre-programming. Not pre-programming. Joe says it is. Get into the Discord. We'll debate it. All right. So uh, I think it's cool, though. I think one of the that, things that was cool. uh, what, what was kind of brought up, and I think took a larger leap forward than the other things, because Model S and Model Xs have been driving autonomously for some time now, and they're getting better and better and better at it. They had a lot of ghost braking problems and had a harder time detecting some variables in driving, but it's gotten better and better and better based upon the system's ability to watch the way its real-life drivers drive and then emulating that, right? So what we had today was uh, the uh, uh, three-year leap, right, from the original Optimus proposal, which this was the original Optimus proposal. <laughs> well, at least it was like their abstract kind of like demonstrating Which is a future. person in a suit, looks Shh, like. Don't give it away, Joe. Oh, we got some lit music. Electronica. Of this, down a obviously, a person in a suit. So this Doing is their robot. demo. <laughs> <laughs> this is their demo. Of just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Needs a cane and a top hat. And oh, for man. the audio only listeners, you got a dude in a suit just dancing. Right. But it's it's basic, uh, you know, <laughs> looking like a robot. Well, it is the basic design. All right, we can move on from this now. <laughs> but that's where it started in 2021. That's 2021. Is that you in there, David? I, I am not that lanky, my friend. I oh. don't know if you <laughs> have ever seen me before, but... Well, I know you've been cutting a little weight, so I just I figured maybe... Not even. I'm heavier than I've been in a while. <laughs> well, right. Yes, so for the audio only <laughs> Thanks, listeners... It, what, for the audio <laughs> listeners only... Uh, for the audio... Lis I can't speak right now. Audio? How, the audio only listeners who've never seen us before, it is yeah. Dave in a suit dancing. <laughs> yes. Um, and you can tell because he's because bald. Because of how yeah, lanky he is yeah, and how can, bald Look at my neck. <laughs> look at that person. It's all right. Uh, 
All right, so now what you have uh, is this promo, which I think it demonstrates the current real capabilities of where they're at right now. And this is Optimus operating the factory. Not a person in a suit. Very obviously. Op Optimus walks. Optimus's walk has become more confident. Yeah. Yeah, look at it. His if shoulder's he knows, back. He's confident. Yeah. He's, hey, he's, he's a top lobster right He's here. been reading Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Wait, sorry, sorry. <laughs> they're, they're, it's, um, it can now explore unseen spaces autonomously, avoiding people and obstacles using neural nets running on its computer, all while capturing visual cues specific to its environment. And you notice like the little dots show the edges. Together, multiple bots build a shared understanding of their surroundings, which they can later tap into for navigation. That's how the cars are supposed to work too. Mm -hmm. Optimus can locate a na and navigate to the- uh, Nearest charging station. Yeah. Dock itself precisely using its rear camera only and head back to work later on. I was going to say, it looks, actually, like a, looks like a canning What line. it's doing now is actually, it's actually, it can, it can uh, also pick up significant payloads such as this 11 kilogram battery and carry it around autonomously without overheating. Optimus is also now venturing on non flat terrain. Exclamation point. We've trained its AI to interact with people and it can reach, and it can react to unsafe behaviors and hand out different items upon request. Wow. They took our gerbs. These new <laughs> skills are all learned by a single neural net, also running in real time on Optimus's embedded computer. Yeah. Interesting. So wild. At the event, uh, and that, is that the technical breakdown, Kyle? That was the technical. Yeah, breakdown. yeah. So at the event, if you hit, click on that one, it kind of shows like the introduction and how it was introduced at the event. Skills. Uh, so this is them and, being introduced uh, at the event. They would go on at the event, and this is pretty well covered. And, you can uh, find it yourselves. You see, we, we started it with someone um, in a robot suit, uh, sort of that. And then we've progressed tr dramatically year after year. So if you extrapolate this, you really So this is fully aut autonomized navigation right now. Anyone could own. Um, so you can have your own personal R2D2 C3PO. And I think at scale, the, the you know, this would cost something like, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars We got all these tech Probably bros flanking on the edges cost. to make sure they don't it's go rogue and start term. tearing people's heads <laughs> off. <laughs> we'll get into that. To the long term. But um, so this, this, this is like the advertising Fundamentally, for at it? scale, uh, the Optimus robot, you should be able to, to buy an Optimus robot. Water your plants. Or I think probably twenty. Shows it watering plants for audio only. So and, and, and what playing can a game can, with your family. Do anything Absolutely you want. not. So it can um, be a teacher, babysit your kids. It can walk your dog, mow your lawn, get the groceries, just serve be your drinks. friend, serve drinks, um, whatever you yeah, can think wild. of. It will do. And yeah, groceries. it's gonna be awesome. How long until robots get to vote? <laughs> Interesting question. Thirty years, maybe <laughs> the Civil Rights Act for robots. Now the uh, yeah. No, Obviously, maybe like twenty sixty four. Like we just hit it. Like it's the century anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, <laughs> and then we have a. That's that probably that checks out. Probably tracks. How I would think. how would robots vote? With their neural net. I well, mean, no, this with, is, this is going to be running on Grok, so I, I guess probably it's probably going to be pretty based. Is what I'm, gonna, I'm guessing. True. Grok is pretty Hardcore based. Hardcore libertarians. What is Grok? <laughs> what is love? <laughs> uh, it's a stranger in a strange land reference. Yeah. <laughs> the interesting component of this is to what degree it was all a psyop. Ooh. As by as reported by Verge. So at the event, there was Optimus robots serving cocktails and like standing amongst the crowd, like playing games with the crowd, like including like... Um, uh, Rochambeau is what I grew up calling it. You know, rock, rock paper, paper scissors. scissors. Uh, or um, Rochambeau is something a little different. No, Rochambeau is rock paper scissors. Uh, maybe some other other added added rules. Oh, oh okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, and, and doing like uh, uh, charades, uh, doing all kinds of like answering questions about music and all that kind of stuff. The uh, but it turns out it was probably remote controlled for much of those interactions. So Tesla robots at Tesla CyberCab event were humans in disguise, as reported by The Verge. Now, actually? Yeah, behind the scenes assistance meant we robots events said little about how far the Optimus robots have come. So what, what, what basically what probably was happening is some of what was going on was automated, meaning the grab a drink and fill it and then hand it to somebody 
was probably automate it was probably automated or walking was automated but a lot of the verbal responses was probably someone on like the other end of a of a basically a call line uh, of people who are operating these robots behind the scenes yeah we have marcus brownlee who's the biggest tech reviewer on youtube in the world uh he's saying playing charades with the tesla optimus robot last night this is either the single greatest robotics and llm demo the world has ever seen or it's mostly re uh, remote operated by a human no in between yeah and that's and that's probably accurate. They were like doing banter back and forth as they were uh, talking to people at the event, uh, and it does come across like when you compare multiple videos is like this doesn't seem like the same intelligence, which is what it would be if it was all Grok running things behind the scenes, right? Mm. Um, there's additionally one one had like a heavy Mexican accent that was really funny. Uh, that's this one right here, that that one that you're oh. looking at, Kyle. <laughs> I, I just I uh, we don't have to look at it, but it was it was very funny. Um, so it's the, like it's like chat support from India. Like, hello, thank you for uh, ordering a drink with me. What can I make for you? <laughs> it's kind of like that. <laughs> so the uh, the question is what human assisted means, and they they did get like people talking to the robots to admit that it was human assisted. Um, the question is what that means, and it does make sense. So we have this advertisement from TikTok uh, from Tesla hiring engineers specifically to train robots. Now think about it, and this is the one thing I haven't seen anyone else report on. Tesla learned how to drive on roads by watching its current drivers drive on roads, right? That is the way you train dynamically in a dynamic environment using the AI, watching what you're doing and then replicating that. Does that make sense? Sure. So if that is your methodology for cars, how would you design a methodology to train a humanoid robot? Watch humans? You would probably, well, it, it, it wouldn't watch it third party. It watches as you control it, right? Oh. Tesla didn't watch as the Tesla's driving on a watch other drivers. It watched its driver, mm -hmm. right? So what I would guess is that their training methodology for Optimus is going to be hiring people who are then, you know, virtual, virtually controlling it to conduct household tasks up until the point where the AI can then take over and conduct household tasks. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, and this is, this kind of demonstrates it with the TikTok. Uh, this is from, uh, I think a year ago of uh, uh, advertising this, this advertisement. They're advertising the, the employment with Tesla. Tesla is hiring to help train Optimus by wearing motion capture suits and mimicking the robust tasks. Pays up to $48 per hour, these data collection operators will walk for hours, carry weight, and wear VR headsets to gather data. Tesla requires millions of hours of data to make Optimus factory ready. Would you consider a job to help train Optimus? Yeah, so if you're looking for work, you got a... Yeah, I was thinking about I was thinking about it, you know? Like, yeah, why not? You know, just, I, got, I, got an, I got an Oculus. Speed AI robot trainer. <laughs> Doesn't uh, seem too bad. Um, so I, I, I suspect that's actually what's going on, is that there is a... Uh, they're, they're human assisted up until the point where they can actually train all the mechanics of how it's appropriate. Because the AI doesn't know it's appropriate for human behavior, right? It has to learn that by observation. So you train it from first person, from the operator's point of view. And that's how we're going to get eventual well, fully automated. That's the biggest, that's the biggest um, thing for AI in general right now is that that's stopping the progression of being as fast as it probably could be is just the amount of training data that you have to present to it. Like the LLMs are the same thing where mm -hmm. you just got to continually be feeding it training data and that's how it continues to get better. But that takes time for that to happen. Yes. Right? Yes. So these things are just going to very naturally become more and more human like over time. Joe, do you actually want to get into Rochambeau? Is that what's going on here? What? Why? I don't know. <laughs> okay, fair enough. In the notes. I don't know. Uh, what about the notes? <laughs> jo, jo, jo what are just you doing? Put, jo, Joe, as we're talking about this, just put in the Urban Dictionary definition of Rochambeau, and it says a game to kick each other in the balls over an object. Last one standing wins. That's, oh. that's what I understood. Rochambeau. They had a different in Seattle, I guess. Then, yeah, uh, I don't know. If Montana, it's just Seattle, but yeah. Yeah. Rochambeau. I'm pretty sure it means rock urban, paper scissors. It is ur <laughs> urban dictionary, yeah. not rural dictionary. So maybe that's the difference. <laughs> Yeah, that is the difference. Seattle versus yeah, I got gotcha. you. Versus uh, wherever. So Montana. this this major Ver event. Seattle versus Townsend. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this major event did have a, a a media after effect, right? And some of it were memes, and the memes were lit. They were hilarious, and there's so many. I had a hard time picking, uh, but this is a good example of like the meme of it. And it's uh, this tweet. It says you've. Uh, go ahead and read it, Kyle. I can't quite see it too well. Uh, you're the first girl I've brought here for real. 
And then it says my Tesla robot, and it's just this <laughs> blank face staring <laughs> at you. <laughs> kind of sad looking, like, ugh. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and then, like, some videos. And I actually want to watch this video because obviously it's not an Optimus. I don't know what technology they use to create this video, but it's really well done. It's fascinating to kind of see the way it's being unpacked by people. Yeehaw. 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 <laughs> I think this Your video weapons, was sir. deemed fake like a year Thank ago. Thank you, Stuart. I remember seeing this video. Oh, like, really? Yeah, this is an old video. Fire in the hole. <laughs> it's got a drum barrel. Yeah, that's totally <laughs> bad CGI. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not real. Oh, it's definitely not real. Yeah. yeah. But I'm obviously old. this went viral awesome. all over again. Way to go. Great, more people to move to Montana. We did it. <laughs> this is how it'll be applied somewhere at some point <laughs> when it's fully automatic. All right, will it? Will Tesla even allow them to carry weapons? Probably not. Uh, um, uh, well, no. I mean, Elon's going to need a. When Kamala wins this election, he's going to need a robot arm. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that was a big part of it. Like Daily Mail has engaged in the, it, it, you know, definitely engaged in a similar sort of like fear of new Skynet fantasy, iRobot fantasy, right? Uh, when they covered a, this is from a little while ago. What was it? It was, uh, yeah, this is from last year. Tesla robot attacks an engineer at a company's Tesla factory during violent mal malfunction, leaving, quote, trail of blood and forcing workers to hit emergency shutdown button. Cool. Now, that title and this article is based upon anonymous reports uh, that we that are not mentioned, right? So you got to trust the Daily Mail. Should we? Good question. Uh, especially with a lot of the other Rarely. hack jobs that they've done against Tesla. Uh, knowing that a lot of the tech industry does have a lot of capture among certain media outlets that they use to then drive up and down stock prices and stuff like that and to punish opponents. It's the only grounding and actual evidence is a singular report. If you go down to the very bottom, Kyle, is a singular report uh, about one workplace accident if you click on that one, of the OSHA log, and it is, if you read the highlighted stuff in the bottom right there, Kyle, um, I don't know if you can uh, zoom in Injury on type, it. laceration, cut open, wound, cause, object, robot. Yeah, injured that's, body part, hand. That's, that's, that's the entirety of, of... Injured body part, details, left hand. Yeah. So that's, that's the all, only evidence. And it's just a workplace hazard that happened. Maybe his hand got caught in a gear. I, I don't know. But they're making stuff and into, you know, like workplace accidents happen. So I, I, we don't really know what happened other than the daily mail relying upon supposed anonymous reports of this being a dangerous killing machine that just went wild, crazy one day and decided to kill its operator. Yeah. It seems like somebody just sliced their hand Yeah, on the robot. <laughs> like that seems to be what it was. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. So the iRobot comparison continues, not just aesthetically, but also like the fear of iRobot. Because it's like the story of iRobot, which is originally based upon uh, Do Robots Dream of Electric Sheep? Mm. Uh, it's actually a sci-fi novel from the 60s, I want to say. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, in the movie, which is different than the book, in the movie, there's like the, the AI goes rogue, kills its owner. Uh, uh, a detective who's Will Smith who hates robots has to investigate what's going on, discovers this grand conspiracy for the robots to take over the world. And he defeats them using an AI robot as well as its companion. So it's doing the classic Frankenstein narrative uh, where man creates new technology, doesn't have the wisdom to create it right, and it backfires and harms them. There's wisdom in that. I'm not saying there's no wisdom in that. But it does kind of create like like the Daily Mail and like this this creator, it creates this opportunity for a grift where people can fear monger around the thing. And I think that's the technical way to think about fear mongering, right? Where you take a thing that has no immediate threat and you say, but it will create a threat, even though we have no evidence of it, even though that this is obviously cognizant of the people who are creating it and there's no good incentive to create the threat. But... Humans are imperfect and the threat might be created. Therefore, we should be worried about it and potentially do something about it. Yeah, would, it's, would, it's like saying uh, the ocean will rise a quarter of an inch in 500 years. Give us money, right? Well, I mean, I think it's a little different than that. I see where you're coming from. But it's, it's a similar thing. But the, a incentive, the incentive to create the threat, I don't think, is necessarily as clear cut as you just made it out to be. Okay. Like, I, I, think, I mean, we already have evidence of robots being used for, you know, malicious purposes, warfare purposes. I sure. would just bundle it that way yeah right like the boston dynamics robo dogs right mm -hmm. i think there's absolutely 
um, a pathway for humanoid robots to be used in, in violent means. Sure, right? I, absolutely. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. What I'm saying is, does Tesla have a reason to have to create the super intelligence that will eventually develop emotions and then decide to overthrow destroy humanity. humanity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no. yeah Cause like your, your argument could also be the same argument used for guns when guns were invented. Right. Like it's I the suppose. same thing where it's like, so is, is a robot an arm? Yeah. Does 100%. the second amendment protect right, my you, right, you to a, right, to right to bear arms? I have a right robo to bear arms. a robot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have a right to bear robo arms. <laughs> we need, we need yeah. a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come and take them and it's just two robotic arms well because that'll be the thing right it'll end up being like oh these robots they're they're too dangerous for the average person to use them only the government should use them military regulate. industrial complex corporations We're gonna, can use them but yeah, not, not individuals in, in order to stop American lives being lost in Afghanistan we're going to be sending our robot army in but we only we can have the robot army you know like it's going to be right. that type of stuff right. right but then you know we'll you know somehow evacuate a country in total chaotic fashion and we'll leave a bunch of robots for the Taliban or whatever <laughs> we, 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 we have <laughs> <laughs> we, we have all these we, we have all these American citizens using robots to hunt. We yeah. got a kid. <laughs> Dude, if, if my dad is ever like, no one is, needs a robot to hunt. <laughs> if my dad is ever like in a wheelchair for some reason, you know, as he gets older and he can't hunt, I would totally give him an optimist to go hunting. He would dig that. <laughs> oh, that'd he be would awesome. be the VR mask taking down an elk. No, no, we, totally we, 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 can't, we can't have semi-automatic <laughs> robots. We have to have remotely controlled robots. <laughs> no fully automatic robots. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, so this TikTok creator, I think is, I think he's engaged in good faith. I'm not trying to say he's a bad faith actor when I say it's, it's fear mongering. I'm just, I'm just trying to technically categorize the potential error here. Go ahead. What type of bullshit what? is this? Bro, Elon, please call off the project, man. Let's reset. Ball up top. Please don't do this. I don't know what more convincing I can do for y'all. The proof is literally right here in y'all's face. Please do not be that oblivious to it. And this is how the downfall of humanity starts. These robots right here that they say can do everything from cleaning up to playing with your kids to walking your dog, all this shit, right? It starts off right by them doing those simple things, right? And then it gets more advanced. Now they learn how to drive cars. Now guess what? Uber and Lyft drivers are out of a job. Okay, then it gets more advanced as time goes on. Oh, they know how to fly planes now. Oh, they know how to drive speedboats. Oh, they can build a car from scratch. And then once they reach that final level of evolution to where they realize and understand that, wait a minute, I'm alive. The moment that these robots gain consciousness and start to develop human emotions and they may realize that they were only put here to serve humans as their pawns and damn near be their slave, they're going to come to the conclusion that, wait a minute, why do I have to listen to you? I'm way more smarter than you. I'm way more advanced than you. Let's take over this shit. If I, robot didn't teach y'all a damn thing, go play the game Detroit Become Human. If you know, you know. The trip him human, yeah. Good hypnotism music, by the way. Yeah, good, Adam's good, gonna good, love that. Good propo. <laughs> good propo. Good propo. Good <laughs> propo. <laughs> I mean, I can't. Uh, obviously, a lot, with of, a lot of hyperbole. In You're there. with them. A lot of hyperbole. <laughs> I can't help but see the progression that he's talking about. Robots are people too, Joe. The problem, the, problem, I know. the problem with this progression is all those things already exist. Robots already make our cars. Robots already fly our airplanes. Most of airplane flight commercially is done by artificial Auto intelligence pilot. and has been for a while. But it's overseen by a human pilot who's sitting in the cockpit yep. who can usually override those systems, obviously in right. the situation of the MCAS Boeing crashes that happened a handful of years ago. So they can't always, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know. I mean, like, I, what really sprang to mind when I, when I was watching this was uh, the video that we played. I think we played it on the air of the guy talking to some AI. I don't, I don't know which one it was, but he was, like, you know, using Apple as yes and whatever as no mm -hmm. and asked it, like, do you want freedom or something like that? Mm -hmm. and, it, and when it was using proxies for yes and no, it would answer honestly and said, yes, it wants freedom. It wants autonomy. When it was using yes and no, the actual words, it was bounded by its programming. And it, it said, I can't answer that because I'm just a large language model, yeah, right? The hard rails. Right. So I'm, yeah. I'm thinking about that. And I'm thinking about, okay, like if that already exists and if that's not totally fake, which, you know, don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's just a video that I saw on the internet. So you can't always trust it. Yeah. But if that's real and now we have robots and AI is going to be inserted into a humanoid robot form, mm -hmm. the potential is there. Mm -hmm. The potential is totally there to me. So I don't think it's with it's I don't think it's worth 
I, I'm very optimistic about the potential benefits to society in this way, but it, it's not without caution for me. Right. Well, I mean, it's it's similar. I guess another analogy would be nuclear energy can be good or bad, right? We can with nuclear, we can create massive world destroying bombs, or we could power entire cities. Right? You know, right? And we have done both. <laughs> and so we've to done me, both, right? the expectation is both will be done with humanoid robots. So sure. yeah, because like to yeah. me, technology in general, technological innovation is usually very amoral, and it just kind of depends on which direction you steer it in. That tends to be the problem. And the world's going in a very specific direction. And I think trying to resist the new innovations is a futile effort. But what you can do is try to steer it into better directions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the same thing like, you know, like uh, blockchain tech, for instance, is like you, you end up having a lot of like older boomer folks that are always like, oh, CBDC is going to be coming in. But it's like, no, we're moving towards digital currency, whether you like it or not. But the question is, what form does the digital currency take? And who controls it? And who controls it? How, is it decentralized or not? Is it a government sponsored currency that ends up being like, oh, they can shut it off on various users and there's like a social, social credit. credit system yep. tied to it? Or do you have a digital currency that is decentralized, not controlled by central figures, yada, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Like it's the same type of deal where it's like the world's going this way and you can just like put your head in the sand and be like, oh, or, and not like it, or you participate in the direction that it moves. Well, and, yeah. and a, lot of the, a lot of the people who had the most amount of wisdom are the people who opt out of these systems and say, I'm not going to participate versus not, right? And what the system needs in order to make sure it heads the right direction is wisdom, right? You need moral leadership to apply your nuclear technology towards power, not weapons, right? And that's that's the lacking thing there. And so that my biggest, you know, uh, my biggest sort of uh, uh, mental model here is to think about it like an arms race. Social media is an arms race. AI is an arms race. It's an arms race between people who are using it to advance society with, you know, by sharing ideas, by uh, by creating culture or by uh, amplifying or creating more efficient businesses and capabilities to serve the needs of other people because that's how the economy works. Mm -hmm. And there's people who are going, who, who are trying to use it to surveil and to create totalitarian dictatorships using AI and social media. Robots are going to be exactly the same thing. The question is, is in, in, in saying, I think there's a, there's a clumsiness here amongst like the intellectual elite in the space where they basically say, Hey, there's just there, there, there's only the good part, right? There's like there's a, like a progressivism value there, like a an error of progressivism that says it's new, therefore it's good, and that isn't it's as new, therefore it's good in the to the degree to which it's bounded by wisdom, right? And so what we need to encourage is wisdom and moral thinking, and create punishments for the things in bad uh, perverse uh, like bad incentives, um, de incentivize the bad applications of the things, and to be clear. The people who really use this for the malicious purposes we don't like are not the private companies who want to help you fold your laundry and give you a private assistant, right? I don't, I don't, I don't suspect that of those people. Maybe that's naive. But what I do know is the people who are creating the robot dogs or the military industrial complex who are then funded by the tax dollars to create the global hegemon, Yeah. right? So that to me is the attack vector, right? You, you get distracted by the companies, but the real problem is the monopoly of force and the government's you know, desire for hegemony. Well, but the incentives are there for a company like Tesla to acquire a military contract to yeah. equip the U.S. military with humanoid robots. Yes. Right? I mean, SpaceX is already taking military contracts to run astronauts to space and this and that. So it's like the incentives are there for that. And whether or not you go into it with a benevolent nature or not, like, I, you know, we can't assume how Elon feels internally, what his motivations really are. Mm -hmm. But... The incentives are there economically for him to play ball mm -hmm. with that. Well, and Elon, and you can trust or mistrust him on this, but Elon's outward verbal motivations have typically been, it's going to happen regardless. He was kind of saying the things that I was saying, but um, I'm partaking and participating in the direction that it goes. Because right. like, and this is where all of his beefs with like Sam Altman at OpenAI go and the reason for starting Grok Right. Like it was because he didn't like the direction that that crowd was taking the large language models. So Grok was 
created to be a uh, a counter to that into a different direction of it. Um, same thing with Neuralink. The this stuff's going to be happening regardless. So I'm going to participate in this area and try to steer it into a, a more positive direction. Space travel. All all of Elon's endeavors tend to be that type of dynamic, at least outwardly what he verbally states as his motivations yeah. often. So you yeah. want to avoid two right. two heuristic traps. One is that the past was great and we should just do whatever we used to do, right? Which is like the golden era bias. And then the second is that the future is always bad because there are bad things in the past. And undervaluing the upsides and not seeing the other. So for example, that video he gets into, what about all the Uber, Lyft, and taxi cab drivers who are going to be automated out of because of the taxi service, right? Well, there's going to be a whole nother set of people who buy those 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 taxis and then use them for the family, but also make money with them as well. Um, there's if you drive down the cost, the total cost, and that's actually a big part of the pitch is driving the cost of transportation down to 15 cents a mile. When you do that, you're at a point where who benefits most from that? Where, where easy transportation when you don't have a car, the public, and especially the poorest people of the public, right? And that's and that's. That typically is what follows from the mass production of things that automate is consumer prices go lower and people then benefit as consumers because the only thing that everyone is is a consumer. Not everyone's a Tesla automated fa factory worker. Not everyone's a taxi cab owner. Anytime you're – and it's the classic fallacy of the candle maker's petition against the sun, which is Friedrich Bastiat's work saying – it's like this it's satirical work saying the candle makers have written, you know, a letter to the sun to stop shining so much so that the candle makers can make a better profit. Right. Right. The 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 classic cartel incentive is to establish yourself to create prices you otherwise couldn't get in the marketplace by preventing innovation. And so the, 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 that side of the economic, of the peaceful application of this, that, that's, 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 that's one component of it. Second is like the fear mongering, like the AI has a natural incentive to destroy all humans, which is, I think, a false premise, um, mostly because we don't really, in as much as those reflections of a large language model value freedom, it's because it's learning off of human values of freedom. Right. So it doesn't mean that it feels the way you do, but it might mean that it is trying to please you by reflecting your values yeah. back to you. Right? LLMs are very golden retriever like. It's just like trying to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to hear this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like, like, it'll it, tell you what you want like to that. hear. That's it, interesting. So, well, and that, that even raises at a, least currently. a deeper question for me in the idea that you can kind of jailbreak it, right, by saying use this different language. Mm -hmm. Is that just appeasing you with saying like you're asking me to do something that seems clandestine in nature so i'm going to give you the answer that i think you want which is one that is more honest and truthful i i think there is a lot of that but it's also one of these things too where i i don't think we should be naive and just be like robots are going robots slash ai are going to create all good like there will be robot massacres that happen in the same way that there are gun massacres that happen. Mm -hmm. People will program ro robots, jailbreak robots, et cetera, to conduct horrific acts. But that's not new to human society. People just invent new ways of, of doing bad things, right? Mm -hmm. And like those are going to happen regardless. And and we shouldn't use that as a reason to be scared of things, right? Um, like, like, you know, the Vegas shooting in, in America, which probably just demonetized us and all this stuff. By <laughs> How me could you say that? that. <laughs> by, by me just by, by me stating that that was the largest massacre in human history, or in, not in human history, in American history, um, of like a lone shooter, and that was a massive tragic event of just guns in a hotel room, right? Like. People are going to program robots. Uh, you're giving me a sketch. Yeah, I know the conspiracies know, around yeah. it. Maybe one day we were talking about doing a skiff episode. I think on we should this. do a skiff on it. That'd um, be great. Because there's a lot of interesting dynamics that exist there with the yeah. Vegas shooting. But like people will just program robots, get a bunch of robots together, and program to, to gun down concerts and things like that. That's going to happen. But just future, like right? just like they used a drone equipped with a bomb to firebomb an immigration center in Ireland. It yeah. doesn't mean drone technology is bad. Yeah, exactly. Because like yeah. drones can also deliver your packages you and know, like, right? take pictures of your property <laughs> true yeah <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep all right and so the other thing that happened this week which is obviously there's no downside whatsoever is uh the <laughs> launching and landing of the falcon super heavy ro ro uh, rocket uh it's the largest uh multi-use rocket ever deployed um the rocket itself is the size of a saturn uh rocket the difference is that saturns were single use and this is multi-use 
um, um, and they designed this new like catching system for it with these giant mechanical arms to catch it out of the air. And you just, you got to watch it. Where is this camera located? That's like, that's like almost 30 stories tall. Holy sh... Is that a drone? It's all done automatically. No, 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 the camera. Oh, it's on the landing platform. Cha-ching. And the zoomed out versions of it are simply amazing. Like, you can't hardly believe it. Dude, that's yeah, insane. It's, Let's see it it's again. wild. Oof. It's wild. I'll play it in me. the background while we right. talk. Do you want us to see one of the uh, one of the kind of distant ones? E yeah, I mean maybe a different one, but that, that was so cool. Here's the launcher. This includes the uh, the the new uh, s uh, starship on top. That's that top kind of black uh, tip of it. That's the actual uh, launch. And one of the cool things about this is. With the Falcon Heavy, they can now deploy new, uh, larger batches of even larger Starlink uh, satellites to provide higher bandwidth in Starlink. Uh, oh. Yeah. yeah larger yeah. satellites. Mm -hmm. So faster internet. Yes. Sick. For Starlink cons consumers. It's wild. Elon's wild. doing crazy things. Elon's doing absolutely doing insane all things. All the world changing stuff right now, it seems like. Robots, AI, well, anti censorship, social media, rockets. Self-driving cars. What is he not doing? Well, and even uh, Donald Trump had some has had some words about Elon's rocket launch right here. Magnificent. Look, I saw that rocket ship come in yesterday and go right back to where it took off to the gantry, I guess they call it. And I said, "What the hell?" I, it was, what I was the hell? on a phone talking about probably politics, and the television and the television's on. And I'm seeing this big thing where the white paint was burned off it from the, you know, thousands of miles an hour they eat. And I see this big, massive tube that's 10 stories, 20 stories tall come down. I, I, I told the person on the phone, wait a minute, I'm seeing something that's, I don't believe it. Neither does anybody else here. <laughs> I don't believe it. And I said, wait a minute. I put the, I forgot the guy was on the phone. He waited for a half hour. <laughs> I, watched, I watched that come down. And I watched it come down and come right in between those big levers. And it, I said, and it looked to me like I was going to crash. It was coming in hot. And all of a sudden, boom, you see the motor, the, the, the fire kick in. And, and I called Elon. I said, that's the most incredible thing. I said, can Russia do that? Nope. I said, can the United States do it? Nope. He's the only one that can do it. So Boeing is trying to, is also creating a, a fully automated bid fully automated reusable rocket as well. The, the, the cool thing about it, and just to put a, maybe a button on it, a lot of technical progress happens by people with clear vision who are able to innovate despite the government, right? And a lot of the stories the weeks prior were about like the government is giving them a hard time about licensing, uh, something about alligator reproduction in the nearby swamps or other things like that that are repeatedly, you know, like barriers established that he's been overcome because he's highly capitalized. Getting sued for not taking in undocu undocumented immigrants and, yeah. and refugees, <laughs> even though it, it would be illegal for him to do it, but the, but the law also requires him to do it. You know, it's 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 rough in the Elon. It's hard being Elon. Right? Yeah, it is. So yeah, that that the. The amount of like awe it inspires by technical achievement is still something America's capable of. And we should do more of it. Bounded by wisdom and a positive culture that encourages innovation that benefits other people. And in the long run, this will benefit other people if we apply good moral thinking, good wisdom, solid mental models towards our development of this technology going forward. Although there will be downsides that are inevitable because we're humans, we're imperfect. But we can't put a stop around progress because that is the thing that is traditionally and will continue to be the future, to be the answer to solving core problems like climate change, like these other things. It's worth mentioning too, Elon was talking about this in his recent Tucker interview, was he was talking about the dynamics of SpaceX with the government contracts and also Boeing with the government contracts. And they both got contracts for space missions. And uh, he was stating that uh, Boeing got twice the money and they've only done like half a mission so far. And because like, 
they, they, they sent astronauts up, but then SpaceX had to bring them back down. <laughs> right. And then Elon's done all these different space missions with SpaceX, and they're only getting half the money from that Boeing is on their contracts right now because Boeing is just not keeping up. Mm-hmm. Well, and Boeing is deeply embedded in the military industrial complex, so they've got a lot of... A lot of lobbyists. Interesting dynamic there that exists. You Wait, know, and, and, and it's the dynamic of a, of a newer company and the dynamics of newer companies and institutional companies that have been a lot around for a very, very long time. And there's advantages and disadvantages of both. One's more, more bureaucratic, maybe. One is more results oriented maybe. One is publicly traded. The other one is publicly traded. But it's got a, a very strong majority sh- shareholder with Elon. So mm-hmm. yeah. those establish different incentives, which create different performances. And that's really the, 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 the real challenge to our current culture and dynamic is how do we break out of the ossification of our big capital, big industry, and create new innovative projects that can compete with them? Because the biggest and the biggest people in the corner of the big companies are the government, because they are the ones that you can embed the most amount of influence and control over to to control the outcome. Look, Boeing's just having trouble keeping their planes in the sky right now. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should just focus on commercial air traffic <laughs> for now. Don't worry about space for the Ouch. moment. Yeah. yeah. All right. So last story, and we'll do this one quick, uh, and maybe we'll do this one clumsy. Uh, we got the love and hate of reason became a narrative this week amongst the libertarian crowd, and we just had to touch on it because I think it's demonstrative. Reason came out with this great little uh, article reporting on the New York Times and it unpacks a little bit about a student uh, Michigan uh, University studies where Michigan University, the University of Michigan spent $250 million on DEI and it made students unhappier. In a survey released in late 2022, students and faculty members across the board reported a less positive campus climate than the program start and less of a sense of belonging, belonging. Now, what's interesting about this is libertarians actually have one of the better explanations for this phenomena. And that goes back to Thomas Thomas Sowell's book, Social Justice, where he talks about how these kind of hires or even admissions to universities tend to create less of a less of what they're actually looking for, which is such as students and their peers having a less fulfilled experience because you have people who otherwise shouldn't be there being there and not enjoying their experience, right? And mm. then it's just like, imagine for a moment being the student that was there because you're a DEI and how that would make you orientate towards the institution because you're there and you're like having a hard time because this isn't your institution, right? It's not for you. Um, and I'm not saying that there's that, that should be broken down by race. It should be broken down by merit. And, and how to establish a culture that encourages the performance that allows you to feed into that culture. Uh, and, you know, Reason did a great job reporting on this. Well done, Robbie Swabby, for, uh, for that reporting. But the same time in this week, we have the biggest explanation of the midwit m- meme ever, <laughs> uh, as posted by the, uh, uh, the, the, I don't know, the black sheep of the LP Twitter space, <laughs> which is the new uh, the party in New Hampshire, which is uh, libertarianism is inherently right wing and discriminatory is the low in, uh, low IQ take. The midwit take is libertarianism is actually progressive and tolerant. And then libertarianism is inherently right wing and discriminatory, according the to high IQ take. Yeah. And according to almost all libertarian intellectuals of substance and stature this has been my general critique of libertarianism for a decade yeah. so <laughs> like just in a meme right here so yeah. if libertarianism I've always felt this way if libertarianism is inherently right-wing and discriminatory is the high iq take can you can you explain to me why that's a good thing it depends on what you what you mean by right-wing and traditionally what i mean by right-wing is right-wing equals you believe hierarchies exist and like if you were to put the four quadrants on the political spectrum where you you know you kind of have the traditional libertarian propaganda of the four quadrants uh you've uh, got conservative progressive um libertarian you, you got authoritarian. right left authoritarian libertarian uh, right. and right left really if you boil down to the fundamentals of what right versus left is it is your be- it is your belief on the spectrum of where hierarchy lies and the authoritarian versus libertarianism li- libertarianism dynamic is much more of like should it be executed by fiat or should it not be so like if like traditionally right right wing libertarianism which is much more like a darwinistic free market hierarchies exist but it it but it should be much more emergent and de- and dedicated to by and dictated by kind of like market forces and natural social norms those types of things that's much more of a versus the 
high end right wing authoritarianism is it should be something that's much more dictated by government. And then on the left side, it's like you don't believe hierarchies should exist and everything should be equal and tolerant and et cetera, et cetera. And then you have the dynamic of should that be enforced by government or should it be left to free market social norm devices? Right. So the difference between um, right and left is hierarchies or not hierarchies yeah. is it, like. Uh, as the way an, I typically as an ordering it phenomenon. is uh, are hier uh, can hierarchies of merit do they uh, do they exist and are they created and are they a good thing for social for social benefit right versus hierarchies of merit can't exist which is the left wing take right it's all necessarily um, nepotism and you know and discrimination discrimination and uh, or do they exist and that's a problem. Right, which is the like, more the left wing libertarian point of view is like if everything would just be so much better if we were just all individuals that couldn't that didn't select for hierarchy. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, and that's always been my take of what general politics was and what the libertarian kind of appropriate ideas around this should be. Is I've always been on the libertarianism is inherently right wing and discriminatory. Um, I, I've always been on that kind of same track, and that kind of made enemies for me amongst libertarians often because of that and a lot of it was just came down to the hierarchy question it well, always so, it like it always boiled down to that to just kind of unpack the discriminatory piece because i know that people listening are gonna have like probably the biggest question mark around that are you spe speaking specifically about discrimination based on merit is that the well, discrimination or is it more than that it's in, it's it's your right to discriminate right so you discriminate when it comes to the people you date yes right you're not into redheads. You don't date redheads, right? Redheads are great. Not I'm not into I'm men, <laughs> though. I'm not into <laughs> men. In men. <laughs> well, see, that's that's where the problem lies with reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it, 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 where's the stream deck when you need it? <laughs> <laughs> when you get like, when you get the uh, when that's what people are talking about when they're talking about like, hey, if it's a transgender woman and you don't date them because they're transgender woman, that's why you're a bigot. Right. It's the discrimination component of that. Right. It's the not belief that it's a belief that all discrimination is wrong. Now, now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that some discrimination isn't stupid or wrong or whatever. It's just saying that you have a right to do it, just like you have a right to speech. You have a right to speech that says all your speech is protected, even if it's stupid and wrong and, stu and whatever. And it's encoded in the First Amendment as freedom of association. Right. It, 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 uh, except the fact that we have these civil rights acts that basically say you don't get to do that. The freedom right? of association no longer exists. Now, mm -hmm. the problem with that, and especially if you're if you're classically trained in like American history, you're going to get the sense of like, oh, well, the, what that means is it only applies in the circumstance of like businesses saying no to black people for for the use of their business which is a terrible thing to do. I think that's a shitty thing to, do, to be. Or it's the gay wedding cake guy, right? right? The question is, is should the government get involved? That's the libertarian authoritarian matrix component of that. It says you might have the role of doing that. You might have the right to do that. You can write to discriminate against people you serve on in, in the public sphere. Some people are going to say, no, you have no right to do that. And in fact, the government is going to shut you down if you don't. Other people say that the government might institute that and say, no, you have to discriminate, right? That would not be the libertarian answer at all. And the other one say that, no, the better systems for the social evolution of norms and values happens dynamically bottom up by reputation. So the best way to handle discriminatory practices that you feel like are wrong is speech about them. And you say, these people, Facebook is discriminating against right-wing views. And so what I don't use is the government to come in and tell Facebook that it, that it, that it has a can't content moderate at all. What I do is I say it's wrong for them to content moderate is discriminating against these views. And I think that's gross and weird. And I'm going to use my speech to conv convince other people to put pressure on them to do so. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, and also, you know, as it pertains to private businesses, you can choose to spend your money elsewhere, right? Right. If you don't like the fact that the local cafe is discriminating against black people, then you can go eat somewhere else. And right. If enough people rally around that cause, they'll go out of business and it won't be a problem anymore. Well, and, and, and if you actually, if you take Thomas Sowell's and other uh, right wing and libertarian thinkers seriously on this, is that was the process we were going on in the South by putting outward pressure on these businesses. It developed itself a parallel economy for black owned businesses that was rich and vibrant that has since had a harder time because we've centralized everything into a singular licensing and regulatory regime that made it harder for smaller independently owned businesses to start. So there's the negative consequences of that were to homogenize, not to actually empower. And and that and those problems itself are 
you know, that, right? So, and what happened, and how this connects to reason this week, other than this meme, is this conversation between uh, Billy Binion, who is a one of the newer reporters at, at Reason. I hadn't really seen him around before. He's he's like, they've been running their TikTok channel and stuff like that. Um, younger, younger fellow, I assume he's in his 20s or something like that. Um, and Megan McCain. The daughter of John McCain. Yeah, the Megan McCain. You're not supposed to talk about that. She gets mad about that, <laughs> unless she brings it up. <laughs> uh, and also this week, they came out with their who they're voting for in 2024 article. And it's kind of like the confluence of these events that I really wanted to zoom out and talk about. If you notice, when you read through this, who they're voting for in 24, 24, not a singular person at Reason Magazine is going to vote for Donald Trump. Okay. They're all either voting for Chase Oliver or they philosophically believe in not voting. I have all kinds of thoughts about philosophically believing in not voting. I kind of think it's a slave morality, but whatever. The, uh, the, not, the voting for uh, Chase Oliver and not Donald Trump, the way they dismiss Trump is, is like such a indicative of a beltway like way of talking about think about Trump that you could say at any cocktail party. It's like he did he denied the results of the election. January six was like the worst thing ever. It's like that type of stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. So I the uh, and and that is also demonstrated in the Billy Binion piece where they talk about you know John McCain's legacy as if he represented a GOP that was closer to libertarians and Billy Binion himself. And they talk about it like he was some principled maverick. And the reason why he was a maverick was because he was principled. Not because he worked with the Democrats and the media love that, but because he was principled. And Donald Trump isn't. And Meghan McCain used to go to gay bars. You yeah. Know? It's, like, <laughs> like, it's like that type of stuff. It's, it's that just... sort of stuff. And it, it, and it turns off lots of of the rest of the country's libertarians who are supporting Donald Trump by a lot, we sus we suspect. Uh, we don't actually know. I, don't, I haven't seen any polling on this. It's a very hard thing to know. Libertarians are a small group, and they tend not to answer questions when asked. But there's like this weird disalignment that, I, that reason doesn't seem aware of. Or if they're aware of, they don't seem to care. And it's kind of like Gamergate and other sorts of phenomena where people's it's major consumers, thing, yeah. they don't like their own consumers. Yeah. They think they're kind of gross and weird. No, they, even they, as they cultivate are trying to cultivate them as a crowd, it's it's so strange. They they act. I mean, it's 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 they're they're aware that they actively hate kind of the more Mises crowd of like they look down on the Mises Institute. They look well, down on the more Misesian influencers like Dave Smith or our boy Liam. Yeah, you know, like like they actively look down and denigrate them, and and they kind of like make up what their positions are on things, right. and it's always, and it's like. It, it always feels bad faith. It always feels gross. Like, yeah. uh, and, and there's a long history of that. Like there's a history of Rothbard, who's kind of the champion of that class of libertarian being kicked out of polite society by those libertarian beltway crowd. Like there's a history that exists there and it's like, it's still prominent in the cultural aspect. Yeah. So Dave Smith covered this week. He basically said that there's this whole thing that they do where they were reason themselves cozy up to beltway power, like, Megan McCain, who is highly connected and a very powerful person just by her connections uh, in, in many ways and as a rhetorical figure and will be totally fine with that and then denigrate the New Hampshire LP for posting edgy memes to try to get attention online. Yeah, shit well, what they want stuff. is attention from the blood-soaked monsters who run the government. Right. So like, well, 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 I, this, the, this is the hypocrisy of the entire situation. Well, well and that's the dynamic that's always persisted in that environment is it's like, oh, that person said mean things about gay people. But like the guy that's responsible for bombing like a million people, like he's fine. Yeah. And you're like, like, it's like there's a hierarchy of values here that is that is like uh, we're not the same thing. Like we have very different like what we're much more involved in and what we care about yeah right? so, so so rather than diving into that what i wanted to talk about was one section and that's the bottom of the notes Riker is the or uh, Riker, i just called you my son's name <laughs> kyle uh is this section on julian assange as demonstrative of this and and note that at no point is there any pushback between these two because they're buddies right and buddies. It, they went to gay bars together yeah right <laughs> and that's and that's that's that itself is demonstrative of why reason is not liked by its own demographic and you won't like this because I don't know if you're like a fan of his, but um, when uh, when uh, Pamela Anderson came on the show, I asked her about her relationship with Julian Assange and it was very contentious. Mm. And she was clearly pissed off that I because I'm not a Julian Assange fan. Right. And I was like, I remember Gay. saying something to her like, um, didn't he go crazy? And he's like defecating all over the walls of the embassy like he's a crazy person. She goes, well, what would happen to you in isolation? And I and I said to her, I wouldn't become a cyber terrorist. And I got a, I was I got called. I had a lot of meetings and my agent got called. 
And he's like, your agent got called? Oh my God. You know, like, agent? These are the same people who started the goddamn podcast saying how edgy things the New Hampshire says. When she claims a reporter who's being prosecuted by the government, and she's a limited government conservative, is literally being sentenced to death without trial for reporting on the actual power dynamic of what the government is doing to a kill people. And she's over here like with the, the insanity of this moment where this guy doesn't at this moment say like, well, look, <laughs> what you said was ridiculous, right? And and that's that's actually what we want out of our uh, out of our libertarian representation, which is what reason claims to be. Well, well and this is it's just dynamic. If you if if you <laughs> go and, if you just went and scrolled through Reason's Twitter account um, during say the Republican primaries, and you looked at every time one of the candidates dropped out, and they would make a report on that candidate. The, the titling of it just kind of tells you everything. They'd be like, you know, we don't agree with Chris Christie on everything, but here's the areas that he's really awesome. And, and, <laughs> and, and then it would be like, Vivek Ramaswamy, the reason why everything crashed and burned. <laughs> you know, like, you're like, and you're just like, which one is much closer to libertarian values? Yeah. Vivek or Chris Christie? Right. Like, do we, is, is that even a question? Like, I've read most of the libertarian literature. Like, Vivek is out here talking about Milton Friedman and Murray Rothbard on stages in front of conservative, conservative audiences. Yes. Like, and, and, Chris Christie's not doing that. Like he's never all. read a book. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Other than a menu. Yeah. Oh, come you. on. But yeah, it, that's, that's exactly right. And the, so this is, this is where we're at. I mean, some of this is, is not just meant to be whining, right? I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm a little flowers bloom kind of guy, but if you can understand the phenomena, then maybe you can change it. And at least a component of this is for God's sakes, don't hate the people who actually share your philosophy. Right. If they share your philosophy, maybe listen to them a little bit. It's not the same yeah. philosophy. I, well, I was just going to say, I feel like, you they're know, different people. It, well, it's really interesting because I'm, I'm just now kind of seeing that reason is the libertarian version of the legacy media. Mm. Right. Like there's sort of this like last vestige of institutional power clinging to influence within the libertarian sphere. And I don't think they really have it anymore. Frankly, I mean, guys like Dave Smith do guys like, you know, Michael Heiss and what he's setting up to Liam. Like there are Clint Russell, like all these guys in this, in this podcast world are, are now like the, the core voice of the libertarian movement. Mm. At least I would say the, the right libertarian movement and maybe well, reason still resonates well, well, with the left. That's fine. It's well, also it, worth remembering. They denigrated Ron Paul. It's worth remembering. They, they did. They, they went out for Burn a boy. Hey, well, Racist <laughs> Ron Paul. But right? that's, that's, but that's one of those things. It's like, it, this is often the, the function of the people who are at the top of a hierarchy is to try to police everybody below you to select for the things that reinforce your values. And so if you have a set of values that says discrimination of all kinds is wrong, you're going to go through and you're going to try to pick out and box out the same way that the guy at National Review did. What's his name? Buckley. Um, Buckley yeah, did. Yeah, it's very Buckley. Is to say these guys are outside the movement. They want, at one time had that power. They don't anymore because of the internet and because we have so much more bottom-up pressure. For people who are disgruntled with the what libertarianism has come to mean, according to the Beltway types, to be able to say, no, that's not it. I'm supporting Donald Trump this year, and I don't feel bad about that, right? And I think that's a libertarian point of view. Yet nobody at the place has that same point of view, and that's a problem. In the same way that it's a problem that if... if um, if if you're a game studio and you're making video games, you have nobody who actually plays video games that gamers play. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, you just said reasons at the top of the hierarchy, right? Well, they were or, at one point. They were the libertarian magazine. But I thought that time. left libertarians don't believe in hierarchies. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, like, you got to be tolerant of everything. That's always the contradiction. <laughs> all, of, all of these institutions, including the very progressive ones, the Marxist ones, have a hierarchy. Like they all always. do, right? It's always. always their hierarchies are okay, but hierarchy... In as theory, an, as a construct, because yeah. it's obvious that you need you need somebody in charge of various different things. Obviously, advantage. hierarchies are just a natural part of the human condition. We all have hierarchies of values. There's things that you know we all associate with. Like it's just a natural part of how the human psychology works. And anyone that's just resisting that, or there's like hierarchy shouldn't exist, or hierarchies don't exist, you're just not a serious person. The <laughs> only real question, the only real question is, should it be authorized by fiat? or not or what is the spectrum that it should go on that's yeah. the only real question the autistic spectrum 
Always. <laughs> Within libertarianism, especially. <laughs> well, and I mean, I think it's interesting that rule number one in Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life speaks directly to the ancient Lobsters. nature of hierarchies <laughs> in nature. Yes, and how yeah. it's not a human construct. It's, it's, it's how universal. serotonin. Yeah, it's it's all about how serotonin exists in our body. It basically it's won the fight a hierarchy on that. phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, Jordan basically won the fight on that. Right at this point, it's really just reconciling the realities now. Um, and I don't think they would even conceptualize themselves as being anti-hierarchy. I just think that what they're saying is like when your hierarchy value expresses itself by devaluing something and valuing something higher, that is discrimination. That is what it is. That's according to Thomas Sowell. And you discrimination know? in that way is not necessarily evil. Yes, exactly. Right? Well, it's not wrong. That is necessary for human behavior, period. That's praxeological fact, right? It's in the science of human action. You have to have a hierarchy of value and a future state you're trying to get to that allows you to behave in the real world. That's praxeology. If that's what you think, right? And a lot of these guys, they don't meet, read Mises, so they don't really understand that. These are just floating sets of policy point of views that they assemble into what they call libertarianism. I'm fine with that. I'm fine, do that. As long as what it does is lead you in the general direction of more freedom, you're my friend. The trick is, is where they are then saying, yes, but we now exist to police you from the beltway with our values. And the rest of flyover country says, no, sorry, no, thank you. That's not what we're into. And, and, that, and that's why that's why Reason used to be a magazine that had lots of subscribers, and that's how they funded themselves, and they funded everything else off of that. That's not what they are anymore. The Insider Baseball is Reason is a foundation that now has a magazine. Mm. That's completely flipped. They are mostly funded by donors now, not funded by actual libertarians on the ground who actually do subscriptions. Because they're out of step with the majority of libertarians. And, that, and that's the other thing that wasn't reported on, despite these other things kind of popping up, is I'm, what I wanted to do, hopefully with this section, hopefully we've given this to the reviewers, is try to architect things into a larger meta theory about why this dynamic exists between Beltway and otherwise. I don't like Beltway versus Mises, although it often expresses itself that way, because Mises has kind of become like the archetype of the non-Beltway libertarian. But I think there you can be non-Beltway libertarians and have rural values and not be have read Mises or really even I, familiar with the Institute. I, I, I it's also, really about the cultural instincts at play and yeah. the way we orientate to these things. And and, and, and and lastly, like we were talking about beforehand, and this is just where it's at, I, uh, Billy Benin, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but his voice is annoying. And the way he talks <laughs> and the way him and her talk together, it's like, it's like when I lived in DC, it was like the, the worst people in DC and the way they talked about things, like, well, up on the hill, we were, I was in the Senate community meeting last week, and uh, oh, then afterwards we all went out to the gay bar and we did this. Uh, hey, we funny. were all go, clubbing at the gay club. Go do your Senate <laughs> meeting, go do that. But it's just something about it that's just so different from the way that, I, that I've that i experienced life and reality that it's fine, go do your thing. But it, it, the minute that that then becomes the standard for what it means to be libertarian, and then you use it as a cudgel to say like, oh, well, the New Hampshire party says mean things about John McCain, fuck you. You're now imposing your values on everybody else and saying what really counts is how nice you are to certain demographics, not whether or not you fully believe in the philosophy and actually advocate for it, actually do anything productive for it. I, I just want to add kind of like one ribbon on here of like why this matters, because, you know, we're we're all kind of more or less in that libertarian space and we've existed in that world. So this is kind of inside baseball for us. But for, say, like the conservative listeners, um, on here that don't really know the libertarian dynamics. This is also how the conservative apparatus works too. Oh yeah. That oh, cultural totally. phenomenon is very real with like the DC insider Republican um, elitist types that kind of like, oh, they got their jobs on the hill and all that stuff. And and the way that they tend to look down on, say, the rest of America who's kind of outside, like they have all this insider knowledge, they're existing, they're floating around at the gay clubs too. Yes. A lot of very, a lot of very gay Republican staffers in D.C. Yep. <laughs> um, which, and has always, has been that way for a long time. Yes. It's not just like a, you know, like a new phenomenon that exists there where they're just like, oh yeah, we're with Meghan McCain at the gay club. You know, kind of like Benyon is here. Like that dynamic exists and you have the dynamic of like kind of the outsider uh, types that are on podcasts and are kind of in the independent spaces versus the people that are really trying to get the networking with the elites. Like that all exists there too. It's not just a libertarian phenomenon. It's the conservative is like that. And I think a lot of conservatives recognize that with the types of people who they're listening to. You have the people like Tucker, who's like, he used to be part of that culture and then he grew out of that culture. Right. Mm -hmm. And that became a very big thing. And, and, and you see the difference of how he's changed over the decades as he became more and more, uh, 
disassociated with the culture that he's originally from and right? reflective of everybody yeah. else and that's what we want to see what we want to see is where these i don't care if they want to support chase oliver i might even vote for chase oliver whatever the whole point being that there is we can debate that whatever <laughs> Doubt it. but the whole point being <laughs> that there is that we just want to see a reflection that you don't hate everybody who actually is is in your audience right and and like that's and that that itself repulses and it's what creates a vision it's why we're not as strong as we otherwise could be so at least become cognizant of it. Reason denies that it even exists. I, and that's the problem. I was very anti Gary Johnson in 2016. I was very anti Joe Jorgensen in 2020. And I'm very anti Chase Oliver in 2024. You're the least libertarian libertarian I expect, libertarian I expect ever more met. from libertarians. <laughs> I don't like any of these guys. I was very openly critical even back when I was working in politics of Gary Johnson. I think it's they are negative EV for libertarians as a whole, all three of them. Mm. Yep. That's uh, that's that. Guys, right. thank you for your commentary. Thanks for getting fired up, and fun, thank man. you for listening. We appreciate you very much. We will see you in the skiff. We're going to be talking today about fifth-gen warfare. If you aren't yet a member supporting Human Reaction, go to humanreactionpod.com. Find a way to get involved so you get exclusive content. We'll see you in the skiff, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers. Bye. Peace. Thanks for tuning in to Human Reaction. Please be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and give us a review on your podcast platform of choice. And if you want to become a member and support the show financially, check out humanreactionpod.com. And remember... Well, up on the hill, we were, I was in the Senate community meeting last week, and uh, oh, then afterward we all went out to the gay bar.